and welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the only podcast, to the best of my knowledge, in which two guys talk about movies. Specifically, me, Bo Ransdell, and my old friend Chad Cooper like to pick six movies built around a common theme, and then we talk about them for a whole season. Oh, and we also tell a little story about the movie itself, or maybe one of the people in it. Surprise is really part of our charm. And speaking of surprises, we have somehow sailed this thing into season 10, a season we are calling Hot Wheels. That's right, it's fast-paced action on the highways and byways, with fast cars and some guns, and I, I think there's an ostrich. Tonight, though, you are in for a treat as we return to the mustachioed well for another Burt Reynolds romp, The Cannonball Run. And here's Chad to get this thing started. Drive safe, everybody! Erwin Baker was born to drive faster and longer than anyone else. The first time Baker drove from New York City to Los Angeles, it took him 11 days, 7 hours, and 15 minutes. One year later, he reversed the trip and beat his previous time by leaving Los Angeles. And seven days, 11 hours, 52 minutes later, he arrived in Times Square, accompanied by a reporter who documented the trip. Baker made an endurance run in a prototype car to test the extended reliability and endurance of the automobile, driving for over four months and racking up a total trip distance of 16,234 miles, connecting the 48 state capitals. He drove a fully loaded two-ton truck from New York to San Francisco in a record five days, 17 hours and 30 minutes. But Aaron Baker is most remembered for a record-breaking trip from New York City to Los Angeles, California in a Graham Page Model 57 Blue Streak, where he completed the cross-country sprint in just over 53 hours in 1933 a record that stood for almost four decades. The telling and retelling of Baker's high-speed endurance achievement included various mechanical and physical challenges, including one small detail related to just a single 30-minute nap that he took during his record-breaking trip. Erwin Baker's love of cars was only surpassed by his unequaled passion for motorcycles. Before Baker attempted his more than 143 record-breaking driving attempts, he was ripping around racetracks in the early part of the 20th century on an Indian brand motorcycle. One of Baker's most publicized stunts involved him racing passenger trains from town to town while riding his motorcycle. This was during a time when roads were mostly dirt or mud or sand. And it was this series of local train races that helped Baker earn his nickname from a New York newspaper man who compared Baker to the famous train commanded by legendary engineer Casey Jones, Engine 382, or as many called that famous locomotive, the Cannonball. And so it was that a passion for driving fast and driving far cemented Irwin Cannonball Baker as a pioneer of coast-to-coast -coast speed records, whose legacy inspired another car aficionado, Brock Yates, to create one of the most famous road races in modern history. Brock Wendell Yates was born in Lockport, New York in 1933, and he went on to become a journalist for both print and television. And his first written article was actually published in Science and Mechanics magazine when he was just 16 years old. Yates spent much of his career as the executive editor of Car and Driver magazine, and he went on to become a NASCAR pit reporter for CBS, and he was a racing commentator for a lot of other smaller networks. Yates' passion for all things automotive and the inspiring feats of Irwin Cannonball Baker led Yates to create the Cannonball Baker Sea to Shining Sea Memorial Trophy Dash, a cross-country road race that was really a protest against what Yates perceived as the loss of personal freedoms in America. Specifically, Yates was just pissed off at the National Maximum Speed Law of 1974 that prohibited speeds on any road above 55 miles an hour. 
This speed limit was a law that was provisioned by the United States government's Emergency Highway Energy Conservation Act that was drafted in response to oil price spikes and supply disruptions during the 1973 oil crisis, and it remained a law until 1995. It should be noted that the law was widely disregarded by many motorists nationwide, and some states just opposed the law outright. But a spike in speeding tickets turned this unlikable law into a source of revenue for some jurisdictions, and it was an inspiration for red rocker Sammy Hagar, who made it clearly known that when it came to the double nickel speed limit, I can't drive 55. Yates, who I'm going to assume is clearly Team Van Hagar and not Team Van Halen, decided to stick it to the man with this coast-to-coast -coast, all-out speed race starting at the Red Ball Garage on 31st Street in New York City and ending at the Portofino Inn in Redondo Beach, California in Los Angeles, California. And the race had only one rule. All competitors will drive any vehicle of their choosing over any route at any speed they judge practical between the starting point and destination. The competitor finishing with the lowest elapsed time is the winner. And so the Cannonball Run was born. Any route, any vehicle, any number of drivers, any number of crew members, any speed. It was agreed that the vehicle you started the race in had to be the vehicle that you ended in. Teams couldn't swap out an identical car at some point during the race. If drivers got a speeding ticket, it didn't disqualify them from the race. It just added time to their final time. The team with the fastest time was the winner. And speed alone did not guarantee a first place finish. The race was competitively run four times in 1971, 1972, 1975, and in 1979. The race was featured in a 1975 story in Time Magazine highlighting the race from 1972, which really popularized it throughout the United States. The reports of the race featured in Car and Driver magazine were embraced as humorous misadventures of the participants and not seen as recklessness on the part of the drivers. Yates was repeatedly asked to bring the Cannonball Run back, but increased police presence and legal liabilities for the organizers along with just growing traffic in rural areas and, well, the dangers of racing on public roads made the idea less desirable. Surprisingly, there was actually only one serious accident during all four instances of the Cannonball Run. In Yates's memoir, aptly titled Cannonball, he details an incident when an all-female team in a Cadillac stretch limousine went off the road when the driver fell asleep and the vehicle crashed and it was destroyed, but the only injury was a broken arm. And all of the reported high-speed hijinks were exactly the kind of thing that movie-going audiences of the late 70s and early 80s were eagerly demanding to see up on the big screen. Yates, now remember, he's first and foremost a writer by trade, well, he began working on a screenplay to be titled Coast to Coast. But other filmmakers brought the concept to the silver screen in not one, but two unofficial adaptations of the cross-country race in the year 1976. The first was a film just called Cannonball! Exclamation point. And the second was The Gumball Rally. The first film, Cannonball! Exclamation point, was a comedy directed by Paul Bartell, who would later go on to direct the futuristic road rage movie Death Race 2000. Now, both of these films starred David Carradine, who was a big-time TV star in the 70s, known for the TV show Kung Fu, where Carradine played a peaceful Sholin monk traveling through the American Old West. The second road race movie, The Gumball Rally, is basically the same movie, but it has a wealthy candy maker who uses the word gumball to his fellow racing enthusiasts who all gather in a garage in New York City to embark on the coast-to-coast -coast race with no 50 mile per hour speed limit, the Gumball Rally had only one rule as well. There are no rules. That's the best rule, if there can only be one rule. Unless you're on the Polar Express, then it's never ever let it cool. If you ever see the Gumball Rally, the answer to your question is why, yes, that is a young Raul Julia, star of Kiss of the Spider Woman, The Addams Family, and the original Street Fighter motion picture that you see on the screen there. The movie The Gumball Rally 
actually went on to inspire a real life road race called the Gumball 3000, which is a collection of companies that includes apparel brands, a registered charity, and is best known for the annual 3000 mile international celebrity motor rally that takes place on public roads. It was established in 1999 to combine cars and music and fashion and entertainment by visionary originator Maximilian Cooper. No relation. And by the way, what happened to sticking it to the man? You know what? L let's get back to our introduction. Both Cannonball, exclamation point, and the Gumball Rally were mildly successful, as evidenced by the fact that you've probably never heard of these movies, let alone actually seen them. Yates felt there was a better movie to be made representing the true spirit of the Cannonball Run. You know, without all that Gumball 3000 corporate sponsorship bullshit. You know, the true spirit of the race that gave the middle finger to the man, ignored public safety concerns, and indulged the wants and desires of grown men who want to drive fast and drive hard. Enter Hal Needham. Hal Needham was a Hollywood stuntman who wrote the screenplay for and ultimately directed a little movie called Smokey and the Bandit, starring Burt Reynolds. Maybe you've heard of it. Season one, episode one of Pick Six Movies. Smokey and the Bandit was a blockbuster success, and Needham followed that up with another Burt Reynolds starring film, the pseudo-autobiographical stuntman-inspired film Hooper, which was another huge box office success. Needham was on a roll, and his partnership with Yates' road race movie adaptation appeared to be the perfect vehicle <laughs> for another Needham-Reynolds pairing to produce more box office magic. Originally, Reynolds didn't want to make the movie, feeling that appearing in yet another car-centric movie was not the right move for his career. Needham convinced Reynolds to come on board by reducing Reynolds' shooting schedule to 14 days of filming. He gave him a $5 million payday plus a percentage of the film's profits. Reynolds later said he didn't like the finished product of the Cannonball Run, and he made the movie out of obligation to his friend, Hal Needham. Reynolds also said, quote, I also felt it was immoral to turn down that kind of money. I suppose I sold out, so I couldn't really object to what people wrote about me. Financing for the movie came from Raymond Chow and his company Golden Harvest. Chow was very instrumental in the production and worldwide distribution of martial arts movies and Hong Kong cinema throughout the 70s and 80s. Chow produced movies that featured some of the biggest stars in martial art films, including Bruce Lee and a young Jackie Chan, who, it turns out, made his American debut in film as a driver in the Cannonball Run, with Burt Reynolds having a limited 14-day shooting schedule and the need for numerous participants in the race, the Cannonball Run leaned into leveraging an ensemble cast with diverse storylines that intertwined throughout the film. Ensemble casts were nothing new to filmmakers. D.W. Griffith's 1916 silent film Intolerance leveraged an ensemble cast with four separate parallel plots. More contemporary examples of this include 1963's It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, where a group of strangers are in a wild pursuit to find $350,000 in stolen money. This film featured some of Hollywood's biggest stars of the day, including Spencer Tracy, Milton Berle, Sid Caesar, Buddy Hackett, Ethel Merman, Mickey Rooney, Phil Silvers, and Jonathan Winters. Now, more recently, the holiday-themed romantic comedy Love Actually and the examination of L.A. racism in the film Crash each showcased diverse cast filled with big-name celebrities playing characters with complicated, interconnected narratives. Even the recent Avengers movie spanning the broader Marvel Cinematic Universe does not center around a single protagonist. Instead, these films give multiple characters varying levels of importance in the film's multiple intertwined storylines. They all balance the ensemble cast who really often play against one another and not so much in the world around them. You didn't expect to hear a little D.W. Griffith and MCU in the show open for Cannonball Run, did you? The Cannonball Run features a wildly diverse cast of some of the biggest stars from the 70s and 80s. In addition to landing Burt Reynolds, his emerging silver screen comedy partner, Dom DeLuise, returned for the third on-screen pairing of Reynolds and DeLuise at that time. 
Roger Moore, whose day job was playing James Bond, was cast in The Cannonball Run as a parody of his more famous super spy persona. Charlie's Angels own Farrah Fawcett and her famous blonde hair and her big toothy smile, they all made an appearance in this film to be wonderfully beautiful and glamorous. Rat Pack alumni Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr., they paired up to drive a car. Disgraced racist gambler Jimmy the Greek Snyder, he plays himself as a disgraced racist gambler. Toledo, Ohio native Jamie Farr, who at the time was best known as the cross-dressing clinger from TV's MASH, well he plays a Arabian sheik. Ugh. Bianca Jagger, wife of rock and roll singer Mick Jagger, gets some screen time. Stuttering country music crooner Mel Tillis buddies up with former Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback Terry Bradshaw. Easy Rider Peter Fonda gets in on the action. Swamp Thing enthusiast Adrian Barbeau dons some skin-tight spandex. And who can forget the bug-eyed Jack Elam who appears as Dr. Nicholas Van Helsing. And heck, Brock Yates, the originator of the Cannonball Run race itself and the author of the movie's screenplay, he shows up for a quick cameo, as does the movie's director, Hal Needham, who appears as an uncredited ambulance EMT. With all this star power, the movie hit theaters on June 19, 1981, and it was a massive success. The movie pulled in $72 million in North America and ended up making over $100 million worldwide. Not surprisingly, the movie got terrible reviews from critics, but why would any legitimate film critic like this movie? Roger Ebert described the movie as, quote, an abdication of artistic responsibility at the lowest possible level of ambition. In other words, they didn't even care enough to make a good, lousy movie. How did the word abdication and the phrase artistic responsibility make their way into a review of a movie called Cannonball Run starring Burt Reynolds? The movie wasn't going to win any awards, well, not any respectable ones anyway. Farrah Fawcett got a Razzie Award for Worst Supporting Actress, but she lost to Diana Scarwood for her role as Christina Crawford, daughter of wire hanger denier Joan Crawford, in the biographical cinematic masterpiece Mommy Dearest. The Cannonball Run was successful enough to demand a sequel, Cannonball Run 2, which was given even worse critical reviews than the original. Roger Ebert said of the sequel, it's, quote, one of the laziest insults to the intelligence of moviegoers that I can remember. Sheer arrogance made this picture. Now, arrogance, that is a word I would expect to find in a review of a movie starring Burt Reynolds. The sequel wasn't as successful as the original, and it pulled in about half what its predecessor did. And I know what you're thinking. Obviously, they made a third cannonball run, right? Well, yes, and no. Cannonball Run 3, or as it was titled when it was finally released, Speed Zone, it came out in 1989. And nobody from the first two movies showed up for part three. But guess who did? A bunch of SCTV cast members and a mixed bag of somewhat famous celebrities. The cast of Cannonball Run 3, or Speed Zone, included John Candy, Eugene Levy and Joe Flatterly, Matt Frewer, Tim Matheson, Sherry Belafonte, Dick and Tom Smothers, Peter Boyle, Alyssa Milano, John Schneider, Brooke Shields, Richard Petty. Now, Roger Ebert saw it, and guess what? He didn't like it. He gave Cannonball Run 3, aka Speed Zone, zero stars. Mr. Ebert said of the third Cannonball Run installment, quote, Read my lips. Cars are not funny. Speeding cars are not funny. It's not funny when a car spins around and speeds in the other direction. It's not funny when a car flies through the air. It's not funny when a truck crashes into a car. It's not funny when cops chase speeding cars. It's not funny when cars crash through roadblocks. None of those things are funny. They have never been funny. Now, it's important to note that Mr. Ebert wrote this comment before seeing Disney's Pixar's Cars. Oh, Tomater, the way you say dad gum melts the coolest heart and makes the most stoic face don a gentle smile. Where was I? Oh yeah, the cannibal one. Sure, Irwin Baker's coast-to-coast, -coast, 53 hour New York to Los Angeles record was impressive in 1933. But you know what? In 2019, the New York to Los Angeles cannonball run was completed in 27 hours and 25 minutes. That's pretty impressive. And now, is it likely that someone will try to beat that record? 
Maybe. Is it likely that someone's going to try to remake the Cannonball Run? Probably. And at the time of this recording, Warner Brothers has the rights to the Cannonball Run franchise, with Reno 911 alumni Thomas Lennon and Robert Ben Garant working on the script. Directing duties are currently set to fall to Doug Lehman, who helmed that first Jason Bourne movie, and he also directed that Tom Cruise Groundhog's Day film, Edge of Tomorrow. And that might be good, or heck, it might stink. It might never get made. And more to the point, should we keep trying to repeat what people did in the past in an effort to surpass established accomplishments? Should a Cannonball Run remake even be made when you have the original available to you in a DVD bin in the back of every Walmart in America? And is it fair to let filmed mistakes and outtakes be shown during the credits in an effort to have them impact how you ultimately review the actual movie? Well, there's just one way to answer all of these stupid questions and many, many more. Let's get Bo in here to ride shotgun as we go from the start to the finish of this high-speed, lowbrow, classic 80s era comedy. Ladies and gentlemen, stick shifts and automatics. I give you 1981's Cannonball Run. And welcome to season 10 of Pick 6 Movies. I am Chad Cooper, and I am joined with the fast, driving, hard, shifting, never using his brakes, Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing this evening? Always fast, never furious. That's my motto. I know that's how you are, Bo. This is it, season 10. Can you believe it? I didn't even think we would get past season 2. I didn't think we'd get past episode 2. <laughs> But sure enough, here we are, and it, it might as well say it now. I've come to a startling realization today, Chad. If you had asked me before the uh, advent of Pick 6 movies, mm -hmm. what do you think of Hal Needham? <laughs> I would have told you. You know what? He's a pretty good director. <laughs> now, not only do I I not think he's a good director, I don't think he's a very good person. <laughs> Now, here's a little insight into Pick 6 movies. When we discussed the idea of doing this as a podcast, The Cannonball Run was a contender for the very first episode. The Cannonball Run lives in my memory as a modern day, well, you mentioned in the intro, like movies like It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, stuff like that, but a modern day version of it that was a little bit cooler somehow. <laughs> This is like going back to your elementary school and you're like, wow, I remember how big and awesome this was. And you step in the door and you're like, Jesus Christ, this place smells like piss. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And boy, Hal Needham movies do smell a little like piss. Once you're in them, you're like, Ugh, oh, geez. Where are we? Has anyone inspected this place? No. No, those inspectors were paid off. That was all under the table. We're self-regulating. We, we, the Hal Needham Foundation for Hal Needham Regulation <laughs> says that we're A-OK, -okay, right, Sammy? <laughs> You got it, Hal. Let's do this. Our movie starts off and we see the 20th century logo and the searchlights are behind it. And we hear that oh so familiar repetitive drum roll and trumpets heralding in a quality motion picture. Brum bum, brum bum. Bum, 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 only to be interrupted by a car screeching in the background and crashing into one of the searchlights, making it go askew. Then a small red cartoon sports car with eyes as its headlights zips around the front of the 20th century logo and makes its way to hide inside the zero of the number 20 as a police car shows up in pursuit only to crash in front of the logo. And it's here that we hear the familiar Burt Reynolds chuckle <laughs> yeah right off the bat they know what people came to see it's a cartoonish good time with the biggest movie star of the day audience was like this is gonna be awesome and audience you're wrong and then cannonball run happens 
Bo, this was the sixth top grossing movie of 1981. And I have a question for you. Do you know what the 17th top grossing movie of 1981 was? Oh, 1981. I have no idea. I'm going to give you a hint. It was season one, episode five of Pick Six Movies. Oh my God. All right. Episode. Shark- it's Sharky's. The Sharky's Machine. That's right. Is it Sharky's Machine, Chad? It's Sharky's Machine. What? You got to remember, Sharky's Machine was a Christmas release. It turns out that Sharky's Machine was the 23rd highest grossing movie for the following year, 1982. And that was the year that Burt Reynolds starred in The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, as well as in the movie Best Friends, where he co-starred with Dolly Parton and Goldie Hawn, respectively, for each of those two films. And the point of all this is that these were real deal movies in real theaters with real movie stars because it is easy in today's world with streaming video to forget what a powerhouse Burt Reynolds was at the box office. Yeah, it would be like if in modern parlance if every movie Tom Hanks did or every other movie Tom Hanks did was him crashing into shit in a Trans Am. Yeah. And everyone was like, oh my god, he's doing it again. We love Tom Hanks. Before we kick off this movie proper, I would just want to address my personal childhood relationship with the cannonball run. As I noted in the last episode of pick six movies, I currently own the novelization of this movie that I bought as a child. And for younger listeners, novelizations were essentially a cash grab where movie studios and book publishers would force some out of work hack writer to watch the movie or read the screenplay and then turn it into a paperback novel where shitheads like me would buy it for no real good reason and then people who either one refused to go to the theater but really wanted to know the plot of the movie would (laughs) get their hands on it and read it i disagree i think the true purpose of the (laughs) novelization at that time was you didn't have ready access to vhs so you wanted to remember what happened in a fucking movie (laughs) So when you told your friends, like, wait a second, did a horse kill somebody in that movie? And you needed to refer to the novelization to double check. Flip, 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 flip. No. (laughs) Right. No. He rode a horse to battle, not did battle with a horse. I had that part wrong. I thought it was basically for people that couldn't scrape together enough cash to go see the film, but they could easily just shoplift a copy in their desire to know the plot of a film. Or they were just the bargain hunters who were like, well, it'll take me three hours to read the novel, (laughs) but only two hours to watch the movie. Who's coming out ahead in this deal? Maybe it's where they had a whole bunch of kids and they were like, shit, three bucks ahead for all these kids. I could buy one novel, make them read it all and improve their reading comprehension skills. Oh my God. Like somebody reading the the cannonball roll run to <laughs> just a bunch of orphans at christmas time <laughs> you know and doing the voices and, oh and then captain kaya said dun 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 burt reynolds laughed <laughs> right and then adrian barbeau unzipped her top some more to show the cop her tits <laughs> you know what's so amazing about this film is that it has no plot it has no real characters to speak of. There's no story arc. There is no act one, two, or three. It's basically no. just the race starts, shit happens, race ends, roll credits. Yeah, it, it. the reason we're not really talking about the movie that much yet is because there are three things that happen and you just named them all. <laughs> You know, on another personal note, the summer that this movie came out, I used to ride my bike over to the 7-Eleven near my house. And I think you know the one I'm talking about. It was across the street from that Pizza Hut where we used to go and find empty liquor and beer bottles and like whip them in the air and try to smash them into each other. Mm -hmm. I used to ride my bike over to this sketchy 7-Eleven. I totally got obsessed with collecting all five of the limited edition Cannonball Run Big Gulp Cups. I got all five, Bo. Are you suggesting that 7-Eleven had some kind of deal with this movie? (laughs) 7-Eleven was all in on Cannonball Run. Because when you would go up to buy a a Big Gulp, they didn't trust you to pull your own. You had to pay the guy. And then he just like gave you a cup out of the sleeve. So it was like getting a gumball. And so I'd order my Big Gulp and the guy would like hand me a random one. And inevitably you'd get a few duplicates. You know, as a stupid kid, you didn't realize you could just be like, hey man, I've got this cup. Give me another one. And then the guy would look at you and be like, really? You're fucking collecting? these but that was me i've got three foits 
<laughs> One of the cups featured Burt Reynolds and his crew of Dom DeLuise, Jack Elam, and the lovely Farrah Fawcett. There was one that featured Roger Moore and then Adrian Barbeau and Tara Buckman. And then there was one that featured um, Burt Reynolds and Roger Moore with other notable stars of the film with smaller headshots. And then there was one with just the two ladies on it, the sexy ones. And then there was one with Mel Tillis and Terry Bradshaw. On those last two, they were kind of the, the Fredos of the bunch. And for people like me, this was a really important thing to do in your summer. We had it so easy. <laughs> then we go to the Pizza Hut and whip liquor bottles in the air and try to smash them with empty beer bottles. Mom, I need the Terry Bradshaw Cannibal <laughs> Run Cup. What? I've been at work all day. What are you saying? <laughs> Those words don't even make sense. Terry Bradshaw plays football. He was in a movie and and the 7-Eleven is selling memorabilia? <laughs> Just listen to yourself, you stupid kid. Our movie starts proper and we hear the theme song of the film entitled Cannonball, written and performed by Ray Stevens. And Ray Stevens, of course, Bo, is most famous for his comedy pop hits, The Streak and Guitar Zan and Ahab the Arab, a song that is curiously insensitive to so many cultures than the title implies. More than you would think. It's racist. It's sexist. It's offensive to other cultures. It's perfect for this movie. In in this song, Cannonball, Ray Stevens sets up our movie with a pretty good white man version of a Barry White sex anthem, minus the soul of Barry White and overt sexuality, because he's got the female backup singers chiming in as Ray Stevens asks song questions, as we see this black Lamborghini speeding through the desert as the sun comes up, and Ray Stevens and his female accompanist, they are just kind of singing that funky white boy music, and Ray Stevens asks, what do you say when you write no words? Feeling. Feel a song that's never been heard. Sing it. How do you know if you did it at all? Answer. What do you do when you've done it all? Ball. Cannonball. Cannonball. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. Be anything you want to be. It's not what you got, it's how you use it. You be you and I'll be me. It's a matter of style, you can fake it. Mile after mile, cannonball, cannonball. <laughs> Thank you, I practice all day. This song really gets you jazzed up for the movie. Am I wrong? No, you're absolutely right. There is that kind of 70s guitar riff that wah, wah, wah. And you got and the it, drums like cannonball. Yeah, and it sounds like you're about to have a good time. And again, cannonball run happens. It'd be like if if you went into a strip club and you paid for a lap dance and you're sitting on the couch and you're like, this is going to be great. And then she just kicks you in the dick. But so we have a Lamborghini piloted by a couple of sexy ladies, Adrian Barbeau and Tara Buckman. They stop by a 55 speed limit sign. Mm -hmm. And Chad, these sassy young ladies have a spray can at the ready and they just draw a big old X on that 55 yep. and are like, fuck you, Johnny Law. We're sexy ladies and we don't live by your rules. We're going to drive however fast we want. So there's a cop uh, on their tail uh -huh. and we get a little cat and mouse, if you will, <laughs> between Lamborghini and cops. Like, like the cops pull alongside and they're waving the car over and then the Lamborghini zooms ahead and then and they hide for a little bit and then they come up behind the cops and the cops finally radio in and they're like hey we're following this Lamborghini and the dispatcher is like hey you guys are really milking the clock out there you've been chasing one car for like three fucking hours and you're almost at the state <laughs> line good job you didn't work today now, how about you turn around and come back? Other people need to use that cruiser. During this whole scene, we see an introduction of all the actors and actresses in this film. But there are well over a hundred people in this movie. And we're going to do our best to keep them all straight. Yeah, but there's only like eight that matter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're like, yes, Mel Tillis and Terry Bradshaw are in this movie, but for like two scenes and it can best be summed up by stuttering alcoholic is the co-pilot of Drunken Hillbilly. <laughs> Were those their character names? I didn't look them up in the final credits. They might as well be, man. They're... <laughs> 
like they're also kind of my favorite thing about the movie. <laughs> well, as noted in the Christmas Vacation two episode, they got their own TV show pilot out of this. Of course they did. <laughs> Mel Tillis has a weird charisma. He's like a cult leader. Like, you can't put your finger on it, but also you want to hear what he has to say. Are you laughing at him or with him? A little of both. <laughs> I mean, I'm not above it. When he just spits pool water out of his mouth like a goddamn garden fountain and then stammers his way into getting <laughs> Budweiser. I mean, how do you not laugh at that? I'm just a man, Chad. <laughs> Our Lamborghini unceremoniously just gets away. There's no wily e. Coyote moment where the Lamborghini outfoxes the cops. It just kind of drives off and that's it. Yeah, there's no punchline at all to this scene, <laughs> which it really kind of lets you know what you're in for, which is... <laughs> You know, it, it's a, a phrase that we like to use around here uh, when we talk about films scientifically. But this is a real <laughs> cock tease of a movie where there's a lot of this of just like, hey, here's a setup and then nothing. <laughs> then we cut to Dom DeLuise, who is rolling up into JJ's garage where they run a delivery service, question mark. They deliver things by land, sea or air. And JJ McClure is Burt Reynolds character in this film. And that's a great name for a Burt Reynolds character. Yes. And by the way, I'm not referring to him as jj mcclure at all in this review because he's burt reynolds for the entire film yeah of course and dom de Louise plays dom de Louise. i don't remember what his name is vincent he's two hours <laughs> late and burt reynolds is like hey we're you know we're on a schedule here where the hell have you been <laughs> <laughs> you know dom de Louise, like I'm, I'm sorry i'm sorry but one of my hamsters was having an anxiety attack he was acting so crazy i couldn't leave him he also ate a, a piece of tail and Henrietta wasn't even bothering him. But this movie is rated PG, which means parental guidance is suggested to help younger viewers navigate the text and subtext of the film. And it's really here that committed parents would explain to their children that tail is a double entendre as both the tail of an animal as well as a euphemism for a woman's nookie. Right, which the hamster apparently did it all for. <laughs> Burt Reynolds says... Uh, they've uh, they've got uh, vets for that. We've uh, uh, we got bigger problems on our hand, Tom Deluise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he tells them like, <laughs> you know, just uh, imagine those hamsters on uh, little wheels, and uh, you know, just run their little hearts out on those. And he's like, oh, that'd be great. Wouldn't it be great if we could have the hamsters with us, just you and me and them and him? Oh my god! And this is where Burt Reynolds is like. Shut the fuck up about him. I don't want to talk about him. Did you think that the mention of him as he's like, you know, like enraged by this as a modern audience that there was a chance that you're thinking, are these two a gay couple? And this is a sensitive subject about an ex or maybe a three way that went sideways or something. Cause Burt Reynolds and Dom DeLuise, they have big Flanders esque mustaches and Burt Reynolds. He's got this Navy blue tank top showing off his golden sun kissed biceps and Dom DeLuise, man, he is the walking embodiment of a bear. Yes. Gay is not out of the question, but unfortunately, it isn't the answer right if you thought anything about this movie was going to be sensitive after seeing the sexy lady spray painting on the speed sign <laughs> let's cut over to sammy davis jr who shows up at a betting parlor a la the sting where are they las vegas atlantic city bettsville usa and jimmy the greek uh who is best known for being racist <laughs> that's all he's known for <laughs> like for years and years he showed up on like what was it cbs sport yeah he was on cbs sports and then one day he wasn't anyway so jimmy the greek pre scandal is running bets for the cannonball run and sammy davis jr is like look all you need to be able to do to win this race is you got to be able to drive fast and you got to have a good cover you got to go three thousand miles and you got to go at least 85 miles per hour to win the race yeah. Which is important because a lot of the drivers in this movie spend a hell of a lot of time not driving their cars. They're always hopping out of their vehicles to fuck off and play grab ass and beat people up. A lot of them show very little interest in winning the race at all. 
Yeah, there's a, a a whole point in this movie where everybody just decides to suspend the race for a good old-fashioned parking lot brawl. You know, it happens. Jimmy the Greek is talking up his experience here. Like, Sammy Davis Jr. is trying to get the line out of him. Like, hey, how much How, how much on us? What's the, the, the numbers on us? And Jimmy the Greek is like, hey, look, you can't do this. You gotta have experience, a lifetime of experience. And like, what degree do you need to have to be a fucking bookie? What life experience? do you bring with making up some numbers and then breaking thumbs when people don't pay you got to know how to break a thumb i don't know how to do that not effectively to someone else you hire aspiring boxers for that if rocky taught me nothing else <laughs> it's that the best muscle you can buy is up and coming boxers who have no sense of their own self-worth now one thing that's really worth noting in this movie is how awful the editing is because the scene you're talking about just stops and then we get back on the road of some backwoods country byway, and the car that Burt Reynolds and Dom DeLuise were working on earlier, it's speeding along the road in sped up fast motion, a cinematic device that they use repeatedly in this film. So they're going this country road, and we hear the voice of Captain Chaos say, Nothing can stop us, Burt Reynolds. But at this point, as an audience member, you have no idea who Captain Chaos is because you haven't met him right and this is the alter ego of dom deloise that was noted earlier when we were discussing them potentially being in a gay three-way and so the car just kind of like crashes off the road into a bunch of bushes and shrubs and these cops that are in pursuit come up and before anyone can get out of the car a cop says what are you a nut who do you think you are and then dom deloise just pops out of the car wearing this mask that looks more like a luchador than a superhero and he says dun 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 and it's here we're introduced to Captain Chaos formally. And he says, I'm Captain Chaos, and this is my faithful companion, Kato, which was the Green Hornet sidekick. And I loved how this movie is such a reflection of a simpler time, because you jump out of a car wearing a luchador mask and a cape in this day and age, you will immediately find yourself with at least two new holes in your body, entry and exit, and a spontaneous loss of excessive amounts of blood. Yeah, well, he is awfully white, so he's got that going <laughs> for him. I mean, he doesn't look that threatening at the end of the day but <laughs> here's another situation where the movie just doesn't know how to end this scene so the scene literally ends with dom de saying so have you been a police officer long cut to sammy davis jr still making a bet the conversation we were just having in medias conversation where sammy davis jr is betting twenty thousand dollars on like him and his co-pilot who is now introduced to the film the real star if you ask me a a very <laughs> clearly drunk Dean Martin. Jack Elam gets the gothic organ music in this movie, but it's really Dean Martin. Every time he comes on screen, just all red-nosed and roomy-eyed, it is the absolute living best. Dean Martin was always kind of known as a drunk, and in this, it's evidence. He is fucked up every scene of this movie it's awesome there is not a sober moment no of dean martin in this movie and they're like oh yeah he used to be a formula one driver or whatever whatever our reason is to have sammy davis jr and dean martin in a car and then there's a really bad gag where they say well god is gonna be our co-pilot or sammy davis jr says this and dean martin says wait a second god's gonna be our co-pilot but we got two seats and there's two of us where's it gonna sit <laughs> Sammy! Come here, I love you, you son of a bitch. I love this joke, Bo. It's one of my most favorite jokes in the whole film. It's so stupid, and he's so stinking drunk. It's the best. He smacks him at the end of it. Just a good old-fashioned drunk smack in the face. <laughs> Let's cut to Burt Reynolds and Dom DeLuise flying in an airplane. And Burt Reynolds says to his friend, Dom DeLuise, listen to me, El Porco. And Bo, you don't make fun of your friend's obesity. That's not a friend. No, no, you have an intervention. And maybe he's working up to it. He's just like, hey, I'm letting you know. You're about to get a talking to you about your dietary habits. You know what I like about it is that he calls him El Porco. So he's not only making fun of him for being fat, but it's kind of racist as well. Because there's no reason to bring in El Porco. This movie doesn't even flirt with casual racism. No. It just gets down to business. I will say, though, I love this stunt of this plane landing in the middle of this town, which is what happens. Like, Burt Reynolds discovers, like, hey, uh, turns out we're out of beer. I'm uh, drinking and flying. <laughs> 
Yeah, he's like, uh, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I, uh, I finished off this uh, six pack. I mean, uh, 12 pack. We gotta go. We gotta pick up a little beer. I don't know why my my Burt Reynolds sounds like my Dennis Miller. I'll I'll try to refine that. It, it, <laughs> it swings that way real quick. I noticed it as well. So I with me, I mean. Um. So anyway, they land this plane in the middle of this fucking city, and it's kind of fun here to see where the shooting barricade is, like where the crowd has lined up to watch this stunt happen. The, the local townsfolk of wherever the hell they shot this, everybody came out. They're all snapping pictures with their polaroids <laughs> yeah it's great like every scene where there's it happens in a town like this you can see all the people just being like oh is that burt reynolds oh my god but you know it's great burt reynolds wasn't there for shooting at all dom de louise was but this was not one of burt reynolds 14 days on set i'm sure because what happens is the plane fucking lands then dom de louise gets out of the plane and has a whole scene inside this store where he's singing a little song about how he's got to get beer <laughs> And, which i get i know that song yeah i've done it you know <laughs> getting some beer gonna go home gonna get drunk <laughs> flying a plane go in the air hope we don't die <laughs> right <laughs> piss in a cup <laughs> pour it over my ex-wife's house hope fuck you bitch hope if i crash it's not on a school how adorable is dom deloise in everything he's really great at this like his little song is really funny there's a some adr of burt reynolds like well they're musing about what kind of vehicle to use <laughs> in the cannibal run <laughs> and he goes how about a black trans am nah that's been done <laughs> and and it was like, oh, this is the early days of fan service in movies. Where it's just like, oh, I, I, you remember that, Martha? Mother, mother, do you remember when we saw him in the movie with the Trans Am? Part one and part two. Two. <laughs> right. Then they take off again, which is another cool stunt where this plane just rolls down a street and takes off at a near vertical. It's kind of cool. You don't see shit like this in movies today. And I'm not hearkening back to a simpler time. I'm hearkening back to a more irresponsible time where you would actually land a plane on Main Street USA and who gives a shitberg America. Yeah, it is the half step away from the Bill Hicks proposal <laughs> of using the elderly in stunts. <laughs> <laughs> this is an idea whose time has come um that scene's over and we cut to a mansion with a swimming pool and it's here we get to meet roger moore's character seymour and roger moore is of course the third person to play james bond on the silver screen and when the cannibal run came out on june 19th one week later roger moore starred as james bond in for your eyes only which is really strange to think about that you could see him playing james bond in one theater and then walk across the hallway and see him playing a parody of that exact same character in the cannonball run yeah i love the music that accompanies his entrance to the <laughs> jim blonde 008 music that they've got going on there just enough notes you know in this scene roger moore is talking with his mother who reminds roger moore that his name is actually Actually, Seymour Goldfarb Jr., heir to the Goldfarb Girdle Fortune. Uh-huh. <laughs> Girdle. That's a funny word. Though. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, it's a broad comedy. Yeah, broad comedy is a comedy for anybody who finds the word broad funny. Oh, man. Everyone on set <laughs> thought this was hilarious. His mother goes on to say, you are not Roger Moore. You are Seymour Goldfarb, but you're pretending to be that Roger Moore running around pretending to be a spy. Bye. Do you got that, audience? During this conversation, the mom reveals that someone in their employ found a gun that was in Roger Moore's bedroom. And then we get that knockoff James Bond music that we love so much. And then Roger Moore picks up the gun and says, I warned you not to interfere in my business, mother. You know too much. And then he aims the gun at his mom's head and pulls the trigger. And out pops a little stick with a flag on it that says, bang. And then Roger Moore tells his mother, oh, mother, you're too Jewish. And I was was like man i think most people who saw this movie in the theater thought that anybody who's a jew is quote 
too Jewish. I think that was a real common common <laughs> belief among big Cannonball Run goers. The thing that's crazy about that, though, is it's a real bucket of water thrown at you where he's like, your problem, mother, is you're too Jewish. And you're like, what? What? <laughs> I don't even understand what that means. She's too uptight? Is that what you're getting at? I don't know. Right. I don't understand. Like, I I don't understand your racism. And, it's, and it bothers <laughs> me that I don't understand how you're racist. I just know you are. <laughs> and then we cut... <laughs> to Burt Reynolds and Dom DeLuise, and now they're in a speedboat. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I just found some keys in this thing. <laughs> and Burt gets distracted because, of course, he does, because there's a, a boatload of sexy ladies. And he just, like, locks eyes with one of them, like, goes eyes to tits with one. <laughs> And she's like, oh, well, well, look at that. <laughs> and goes right into another houseboat. Yeah, but we don't see it. We just hear the crash. Sure. Well, you know, it's <laughs> the mystery box, Chad. It's J.J. Abrams at his best. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out that guy might be a hack. Just saying. That's just evidence suggests J.J. <laughs> Abrams may not be a very good director. <laughs> Um, but so we hard cut to an ambulance where like after this accident, he's in a neck brace and is on a gurney and <laughs> Dom DeLuise just has a big bandage around one finger. Who's that sitting beside him as the EMT Bo? Uh, I don't know. I noticed he was a dream boat. I didn't Bo, That's director Hal Needham himself. He's dressed up as the ambulance technician and Hal Needham says you two tore the heck out of that boat. And I'm like, I'm sure they did. It'd been nice to have seen it, but that, well, he figured he he was saving money by just having himself in the movie to describe what happened. <laughs> that was some accident. It was really something, audience. Dom DeLuise says, hey, Burt Reynolds, maybe you shouldn't stare at girls so much. And Burt Reynolds says, well, nobody's perfect. And Dom DeLuise says, nobody but him him and burt reynolds gives dom DeLuise this look of disgust and i'm thinking these two are in love or were in love once but human sexuality isn't black and white there are lots of shades of gray right. and there's a whole rainbow flag full of colors yeah it's a spectrum and dom DeLuise is firmly on the bare end of it director hal needham tells dom DeLuise and burt reynolds we're about 10 miles from the hospital but we're gonna get there in like four or five minutes and i was like hold on director hal needham let's say you're 10 miles away from this hospital and let's say you can get there in five minutes that means that this ambulance is going 120 miles per hour in traffic that seems a little bit unsafe i was told there would be no math <laughs> Here's what's real dumb about this thing. First of all, it could have been Hal Needham. It could have been Michael Crichton. It could have been any number of salt and pepper <laughs> hair gentlemen from the 1970s, early 80s, I suppose. But there's a moment of realization here between Dom DeLuise and Burt Reynolds where they just look at each other after they hear. Hal Needham says, yeah, you can go through traffic like a shotgun through a goose. Hal Needham says you can smoke through traffic like shot through a gun in this thing. But if you watch his lips he clearly says shit through a goose which makes way more sense is that what they did to keep the pg rating we can have the abduction and drugging of a woman mm -hmm. but human trafficking is fine right you cannot have colloquialisms about poop and animals you cannot say s-h-i hockey hockey sticks uh, hockey sticks together with a tiny eye on top yeah to make a cross but not the jesus cross no the the antichrist cross is <laughs> is what the shi you know is anyway but bert and dom look at each other and, and bert gives them <laughs> he gives it a double <laughs> it's like <laughs> that's his mo in this movie is if it was funny once do it twice <laughs> it happens a ton in this movie but anyway so they're gonna be ambulance drivers in the cannonball run right and then we cut over to a japanese talk show where we hear jackie chan speaking chinese and what does it matter because the audience who's watching this is white and nobody knows he's got a co-pilot who is all horned up talking to an actress from a 
Godzilla movie. Yeah, they're on some talk show. Right, all about like, hey, we're taking this supercar to the Cannonball Run. The co-pilot, the inventor of this car, Jackie is the driver. The co-pilot, the inventor, is just trying to completely get it wet on national Japanese television. Right. With this actress who's like, hey, they hit this button and we hit this. Uh-huh. And Jackie starts freaking out. He's like, hey, get her out of the car. She's going to hit something and make the car do something funny. <laughs> <laughs> Sure enough, the car goes through a wall. Cut to the desert, (laughs) where we see some guys making a joke related to the camel cigarette advertising advertising campaign, I'd walk a mile for a camel. I don't think most smokers of that day could walk a mile anywhere. But it's here we meet another driver in the Cannonball Run, Toledo, Ohio's own Jamie Farr, who is dressed up like an Arab sheik. He arrives at his mansion that looks surprisingly similar to the mansion that Roger Moore was that earlier in the film yeah uh, look we got it for the day don't uh <laughs> we're, we're gonna shoot one in front one in back nobody will notice it's the same mansion so chic jamie Farr shows up and he sits down by his sister bianca jagger and Bianca Jagger asks if Sheik Jamie Farr still intends to go through with that race with the infidel Americans. And Sheik Jamie Farr says, the cannonball will fall to the forces of Islam. I pledge it. Yeesh. Oh, man. It, it gets worse, <laughs> but... it it don't get better you know it's one thing to be overly sensitive and to say like well it was the time that the film was made but this is such (laughs) like an obvious blatant stereotype it's one of the reasons that when movie you look back at movies like this you start to feel a little embarrassed because you realize how much in in your mind you thought they were great and then when you watch them you realize the people who made it were just having a laugh at the expense of like people of arab descent and japanese people and jewish people and gay people and black people short people fat people if you were not a white guy that loved cars (laughs) and tits you were not welcome on the set of the cannonball run (laughs) unless we were gonna get to laugh at you right you know oh look this guy's wearing a wig surely to god as soon as we run afoul of a biker gang they'll show him what it means to wear a wig and cannonball (laughs) runs america it's one of those examples of a movie that feels like the message is kind of free-spirited and freewheeling and that's what it wraps itself in but ultimately it's this ultra conservative kind of view of the world absolutely nestled in a movie that is purportedly about the spirit of rebellion i can't believe i drank so many big gulps out of cups promoting this film yeah it, it, we, we should all be a little bit ashamed but anyway so we leave that scene to go to burt convy super passwords own burt convy nobody knows who the fuck burt convy is now he was super popular if you watch fantasy island he and burt reynolds had a production company called burt and burt remember they uh produced that win loser draw game show and a bunch of other shit nobody remembers uh, fine i mean but burt convy <laughs> has an expiration date like tiny tim does where if like you were a certain age it's like i don't need to know this information like people don't <laughs> need to know who burt convy is now and it's a shame <laughs> But it's how it is. In this movie, he's like a rich businessman. And he's sitting against this wall and he's drinking champagne. He's talking to two of his assistants about, ha ha, stock market, ha ha, money. And he gets up and he's like, I've got to go do this thing. And they're like, the stockholders don't agree with this. He's like, I've got to indulge my own ego. So he hops on this motorcycle and it turns out that they're in an airplane. And Burt Convy just drives out the back of it on this motorcycle with a parachute. And he's singing, I gotta be me. And then he pulls the the parachute to deploy and he just lets the motorcycle go which i was like unless you were over an open desert there is a very good chance that this motorcycle plummeting to earth is going to kill someone and it turns out that there are some ones below and it's a bunch of yokels <laughs> and this one woman i think they're like a county fair or something uh she talks to this other guy in, in denim overalls and she says this is the dumbest thing i've ever seen since that guy tried to jump over the gray canyon and i'm like look how dare you besmirch the good name 
name of Evil Knievel, madam. He is a more insane maniac than the collective powder puff of individuals in this movie combined. I agree, and I also find it hilarious that in my notes the word yokels was also used specifically. <laughs> well, how else do you describe it? You're right. Like, you have a gathering of people staring goosenecked up at somebody <laughs> jumping out of an airplane with a motorcycle. You are in the presence of yokels. <laughs> One guy was holding a pig, and another guy had a piece of wheat sticking out of his mouth. They're yokels! Did someone have a jar of clear liquid? Because... I didn't see one, but moonshine would have really fit the bill. There was a jug with three X's on the side. <laughs> Somebody was playing music with it. Who, who, right. Who, who, Solo who, jug who, band. Who, who. Next, we get to meet character 64 of our film, Mel Tillis, and character 65 of our, of our film, Terry Bradshaw. The two of them are being chased by the Fuzz, and they proceed to drive their car into a swimming pool at the motel where a portion of our film will take place to get away from the pursuing officers. And then inside the hotel, we get to meet our movie's bad guy. And his name is A.F. Foyt, played by character actor George Firth. Mm -hmm. And he is at a meeting that's being held at the same motel as the Cannonballers gathering. During this meeting, it's like a bunch of tree huggers and nature lovers. And Foyt is sitting next to the lovely Farrah Fawcett, who is dressed up to look like this bookish naturalist. And Foyt tells Farrah Fawcett, this looks like a titty turn. Uh, I mean, terrific turnout for the meeting of tree huggers or whatever it is we're doing. Did, did did he just say titty turn no one can resist the allure of tits in this movie breasts will just hypnotize any man who happens to be near them he does not stop staring at Farrah Fawcett's breast during this whole scene it doesn't help that she is telling this story of what she likes most about trees what does she like most about trees Bo? oh she likes being able to lie under them and stare up at the stars and then all your brains out and when she says this Foyt does a real like oh, bah, bah, bah. then he gets called up to speak uh so he's talking to the hippies and this is another of those like super conservative moments in the movie where the villain of this movie is a guy who's like you know what's dangerous having a bunch of alcoholics driving at top speed <laughs> across the country <laughs> somebody should probably do something about that no fuck me all right I mean, if you really follow the arc of <laughs> Mr. Foyt, he is the only person that does anything mildly heroic in the film. <laughs> It's a real unreliable narrator's situation, but <laughs> at the end of the day, he's he's the misunderstood hero. Yeah, he's the only one who's like responsible and trying to help people, <laughs> and not a kidnapper. You know what? I do think that most of the drivers in this film are on some form of alcohol, narcotic. You're right. <laughs> right. He is just trying, like, again, nothing but speed freaks and alcoholics <laughs> behind the wheel of a car on the interstates and highways of America. But it's not even speed freaks. They're going like 120 to 160 miles an hour. No, I meant the drug speed. <laughs> 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 because they've got to, like, they can't stop to sleep. <laughs> The, the shit that they are snorting is the kind of stuff that, like, the good stuff that the, the truck drivers get. So while Foyt is rambling on about anti-car this and Mother Nature that, outside Mel Tillis and Terry Bradshaw, they've somehow pulled their car out of the swimming pool of this motel, and they're trying to tune up the engine. And Mel Tillis says, you know, hiding it in the pool made it look good, but this, this car ain't running worth shit. And, dude, I laughed out loud watching him stutter and punctuate this sentence with the word shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mel Tillis is very funny in this. And I don't know how much of the stutter is, like, a affectation and how much of it is legit or, like, you know, leaning into it for sure. But the fact that Terry Bradshaw is completely nonplussed by it <laughs> never <laughs> remarks on the fact that his partner in crime can not can barely speak a full sentence. <laughs> He's just like, uh-huh, go on. And I think it's because <laughs> Mel Tillis speaks at the speed that Terry Bradshaw can understand. <laughs> 
it's a real yin and yang <laughs> relationship that they've discovered together. Like Master Blaster from Beyond Thunderdome. I'm thinking Forrest Gump and Bubba. Uh, whichever, you know, I the, the two are very similar in my mind. Voight's going on about automobiles and how they're the enemy of nature. And then outside, Mel Tillis just revs up the car engine so much that the vibrations and noise of the engine just explodes the window in the conference room where Voight is presenting to just blast open. And then Terry Bradshaw walks over and peeks inside and he just stuffs a big old hunk of red man chewing tobacco into his lip as he's standing in front of a mural for Hawaii. Tropic. And this movie knows its audience and is giving them exactly what they came for. Sure. A bunch of hippies getting a car through the window of their meeting. Yeah, that's America. It's at least 48% of America. <laughs> right. The s- <laughs> silent majority. And then... <laughs> Uh, we get a couple of dudes in a pickup truck. It's Batman, played by Alfie Weiss, who's in all of these early Burt Reynolds movies. And then it's Mad Dog, who's played by Rick of Viles, who would later go on to kill Patrick Swayze in the romantic pottery film Ghost. Oh, that's right. I didn't put that together, but yeah, so he's awful in this movie. Um <laughs> They, they're like, we can't find a place to park. And his solution is to drive through the wall of the motel. Uh huh. And then Dom DeLuise and Burt Riddle just kind of enter through the wreckage. Yes. In their EMT jackets. And the hotel manager is like, hey, you need to look at Mr. Foy because you're EMTs, <laughs> clearly. And this man has been hit by a car through a wall. <laughs> and they're like, uh, yeah, it's our uh, day off. <laughs> and he's like, for the love of God, you are medical professionals. And Bert's like, all right, I've seen this before. <laughs> Dom, uh, I want you to uh, toss me that bottle. <laughs> and so... Dom DeLuise just throws him a bottle of seltzer uh-huh. and he squirts him in the face, uh, Mr. Foy, who wakes up and is like, eh, all right, uh, we'll deal with the bill later. You've left out an important detail. He squirts him in the face and then he squirts him in the dick with seltzer <laughs> right. to make it look like he pissed himself. That's right. Our, the hero of our movie gets in a pee gag with a seltzer bottle because he's four years old. He has never <laughs> met Mr. Foyt. He doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know his his social or political leanings he knows nothing about mr foyt other than the fact he was arguably fatally injured when this truck crashed into the lobby of a best western his next steps were to spray him on the cock with seltzer and giggle about it sure it's funny <laughs> then he tells the manager hey, um, um, stick a hose up his ass and flush it out with water hilarious we're gonna need a couple uh private rooms and i uh, also i'm going straight to the bar <laughs> this dude from the truck the mad dog dude has a nixon impression here uh-huh. and i only point it out because i'm like this is one of the shittiest nixons i've ever heard <laughs> it's pretty bad but he does ask hey where the hookers where the hookers at what you're expecting there just to be hookers hanging around like bellhops in the lobby of a best western out on route 441 while they're demanding hookers jamie farr shows up accompanied by arabic music (laughs) they introduced everyone of non-american nationality with the most racist music possible right in a peter and the wolf style this movie (laughs) will tell you which character you're you're following by which racist music cue ding diddy dong dong ding ding dong hey it's jackie chan who knew <laughs> so, while he arrives and he's demanding like an entire floor his driver is puking because there's a whole running gag about him being a bad driver but it's not really ever paid off so don't worry about it then we see fair Fawcett and foyt going up the stairs and he's complaining about all these racers and they're going to the motel bar foyt decides he's gonna get to the bottom of whatever's going on he's not sure what it is but he knows something is happening and they're these kids are up to no good right and so he gets on his hands and knees and sneaks behind the booth where Dom DeLuise and Burt Reynolds are discussing trying to find a doctor for the animal. And it, uh, Dom DeLuise says that the doctor that he had lined up was his psychiatrist who is now committed. Chad, you're never going to believe the irony. Uh, mm-hmm. His psychiatrist uh, locked up because of him. <laughs> 
And then Don DeLuise is like, hey, I don't want this fruit in my drink. And just throws it over the side of the booth to smack Foyt in the face with it. So Sammy and Dean come in dressed like priests now. And they're toasting the other racers. While Dean Martin is drunkenly toasting his fellow act, unaware that he's in a scene. <laughs> Sammy Davis Jr. calls the Greek again and is like, hey, put another 10 grand on us because we're we got a great idea with this priest thing. Then we go to Bert and Dom who are looking for a patient. They need a patient and a doctor for their ambulance ruse to be legit. Right. And so Dom DeLuise sees the booth with Adrian Barbeau and Tara Buckman all decked down spandex and whatnot. Dom DeLuise is like, what if they were our patients? And <laughs> Bert Reel says, hmm, I could be real patient with those patients. <laughs> He follows up like, yeah, those two are very uh, lickable. I mean, likable. Yeah. No, I mean, lickable. <laughs> so they go over and talk to him and there's a gag about like, look, I'll do all the talking. Okay. <laughs> he invites them to ride in the winning car and the cannonball. And then they reveal that they're racers. And I actually think Adrian Barbo does a good job of kind of holding her own in this scene across from Burt Reynolds. Right. Where Tara Buckman sucks on a lollipop and unzips her top and shows off her cleavage. Right. And Adrian Barbo is like, hey, you haven't seen our equipment yet. And then Burt Reynolds because this is the kettleball run just makes duck noises and that's the joke <laughs> that literally happens yeah he just goes quack 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 <laughs> and that's it and then he sees farrah fawcett and her nipples oh my god holy shit it must be cold in that room and he sees farrah fawcett and immediately goes you know from like six to midnight that one's for internet nerd andy then he's like fuck you ladies i got, I got something better going on over here he goes over to her and says he wants to guess her name mm -hmm. so he guesses like Mi like millicent and something else and then betty and she's like no not betty and instead of actually learning her real name no 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 why would you do that Bo? let's thoroughly objectify this woman right he's just like you know what i'm gonna call you beauty because that's what you are and she's like oh that's nice i have no agency then uh he explains <laughs> the, his emt jacket by saying that he's a wealthy philanthropist and that he and dom de Louise just drive around helping and then farrah fawcett starts her story about trees and we know from experience mm -hmm. that this ends with her talking about bawling under trees and if he hears that then then it's game over. It, like we're in stroke race territory. And then before she gets to the bowling part, the, like a pot rattles somewhere in the distance and then Dom DeLuise interrupts him. And then while he's talking to him about uh, the doctor, Farrah Fawcett just slips away. Bo, did you know that Farrah Fawcett died on the same day that Michael Jackson died? I did know that because there was a big thing about how her, like people would have reacted so much more to her death on any other day. Do you know how she died? Uh, uh, she was sick for a long time. Wasn't it cancer or something? It was anal cancer. Yeah. Is that the worst kind of cancer to die from? I mean, it's up there. I mean, they're all bad, but certain cancers beg certain questions. Like if you have lung cancer, you're like, oh, were they a smoker? And like skin cancer, did you spend a lot of time outdoors working or, you know, during leisure time? But you hear anal cancer and all manner of things come to mind. And you hear Farrah Fawcett in anal cancer, and you just can't help but be filled with possible outcomes. Get me Ryan O'Neal. I have questions. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's not funny. We cut to Burt Convy, right. and his partner Shaky shows up, and he's kind of this middle-aged, pot-bellied white guy. Yeah, he's supposed to be the motorcycle driver for Burt Convy's little ruse. I guess, because Burt Convy's working on his motorcycle in an outdoor space. You don't really know what it is, and Shaky's there, and he's like, hey, I can help you fix your transmission or whatever. Cut away from that scene over to Foyt in his room, and he's calling his boss, and he's like, I got this situation that it's going to blow the lid off this cannibal run thing this is bigger than three mile island or love canal combined and you're like all right this is clearly early 80s right we cut back to the best western lounge and d martin and sammy davis jr are there and they see adrian barbeau and tara buckman and they stroll up to the bar and this bar is just littered with partially finished drinks the staff at this place are really dropping the ball but i expect a lot more from the thursday night staff at rj mcgillicuddy's at the route seven best western motor 
lodge. Clean up your shit. Man, these people are hanging on for dear life. Look at the miscreants who have suddenly come into their place of business and just torn shit up. In mere moments, a motorcycle is gonna <laughs> shoot through this fucking place and out a window. <laughs> if there are a few mugs that get broken, think you're lucky, stars. That's all you get away with. D. Martin's watching uh, our two sexy ladies and he's getting all hot and bothered and talking about getting laid. And then the aforementioned motorcycle crash happens where Burt Convy hops on his bike and just blasts through the second floor level of this hotel, makes it through the lobby, crashes through the main floor of R.J. McGillicuddy's. It, this whole scene is just an excuse for a big motorcycle stunt. And for Dean Martin to slur a punchline <laughs> where he says, I guess that was the entry from the National Safety Council. Boo, boo, boo. I'm not going to cast stones at anyone slurring a punchline, Bo. <laughs> you know, I think it is charming in this movie. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say charming in this podcast. No. Well, that too. That America's drunk uncle, Dean Martin, just refuses to say a sober line in this movie, which I think is, is, is commendable. Then Roger Moore shows up with our not James Bond music ding 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 dong ding 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 dong ding 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 and it, there's a sexy lady along for the ride and as he gets out of his car he sees a kid taking a picture of like a friend and he says oh well heavens please i'd like media coverage to be kept to a minimum even though i know an actor of my stature is a fuss in your little race and they're just like yeah, whatever. And the, again, that's the whole joke. It is a premise with no punchline. One gag in this movie that I did find funny, that if you're not paying attention, you're not going to catch it, is that every time they cut back to Roger Moore, he's always with a different woman. Yeah. And his clothes have changed into a different level of formal wear. I like it when his character goes up and signs his name at this Pop Warner football registration table out in front of the hotel. And he signs it Roger Moore and not Seymour Goldfarb. Right. And I was like, well, that's his pseudonym. And I don't personally use pseudonyms in my everyday life. But you know who does use pseudonyms, Bo? Who's that? And his alias of choice is Mitch Cumstein, who was the roommate of Ty Webb in Caddyshack. Oh, right. Sure. Uses the pseudonym Bill Stevens as his fake name. When he and I lived together for a short while, he got a surprising amount of mail addressed to bill stevens huh some people just have parts of their lives that they want to keep private hell when i was a kid my grandfather had a p.o box that he had mail delivered to outside of the mail that he had naturally delivered to his home address it should also be noted that my grandfather had a mistress and a child that nobody really liked to talk about that is really a flannery o'connor story waiting to happen <laughs> Um, my, I use Pierre Delecta. After Roger Moore signs his n real name, we cut to this big brute of a guy who's going to be in the cannonball run. And he's holding up this conversion van, like a human Jack with some other nameless guy changing the van's tire. And then it's here that we get to see all of the cannonballers getting ready for the race. We see Terry Bradshaw and Mel Tillis filling their car with what appears to be about 12 to 22 cases of Budweiser beer. It is an excessive amount of beer i like this gag because terry bradshaw is also quizzing mel tillis about like well did you get ice and he's like i got plenty <laughs> then he says well what about something to eat and he he has like a bag of chips and he's like yeah. you know man cannot live by bread alone and that is the gag, is that they've got 20 cases of beer and one bag of chips. Kind of works for me. I like it. You start your scene with a thick-ass redneck picking up a van and end it with Mel Tillis and Terry Bradshaw stocking a car with beer. I mean, <laughs> this is what I came for. Dean Martin is surrounded by what appears to be a gathering of prostitutes. And then <laughs> Sammy Davis Jr. goes over and says, like, hey, please quit trying to have sex with these prostitutes. 
and suddenly it goes from day to night and it's here we get to see the cannibal runs creator himself brock yates giving a real pep talk to all the racers and he calls everyone there highway scofflaws and degenerates yes there's like two or three things in the movie that if you flesh that stuff out it would be legitimately a pretty good movie and one of those things is this idea of between here and there you have all these police set out to get you but you guys are sort of the pirates of the interstates right and that doesn't ever pay off at all but it's a interesting and kind of romantic notion the bad guy in this movie should be the cops and it's not it's foyt and he doesn't really work well as a foil right because he doesn't do anything bad in the movie no it should be a buford t justice type character that corrals all the cops aka the man to be the bad guy against our rogue street hooligans that are you know wreaking havoc and having fun aka society (laughs) so you get off your ass and you find that dog (laughs) brock yates says the record's 32 hours and 51 minutes and the the race is on can you imagine driving from new york to like san diego or wherever the hell they're going in this movie in just a little over a day i mean yes i can't they're like i love this idea shit i've gone from florida to the mason dixon line and that's about killed me i like something like this where it's sort of this race that isn't a direct like one-to-one around a track kind of race but like you know again the it's a mad 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 world stuff of like we're around the world in 80 days we're gonna get from this point to this point and all the adventures along the way and that sort of story and that sort of idea i think is great i really like would you watch a remake of the cannonball run yeah sure i would be curious what you would do with it i think there is a way to present it as like these are sort of modern day outlaws and make it more fun if you do it as a hundred percent practical effects if you do it more like tarantino's death proof where it is real car stunts with real actors and real stuntmen doing crazy wacky shit i think there is an element of nostalgia and impressive filmmaking that could really make a cannonball run remake much more visceral you do it like first of all you get george miller to direct it. oh my god and and it's four hours long and it just starts with a gun firing and all the exposition comes from within the cars and cb discussion yeah you just get the cast of oceans 11 and give them all crazy backstories and then bring in a few other people Mm -hmm. and then that's the movie is and and you make it kind of that high sort of film of like hey we're trying to get from here to there in a way aside from just like hey we're gonna be in an ambulance but you make it more of a like oh if we go to here to here then we're going to be able to like catch this ferry and that's going to get us ahead. But if we miss that, like if we're rolling the dice and we're going to be an hour behind if we do that. The adventure is how do we do this in this short amount of time? What if I told you that Edgar Wright was directing the Cannonball Run in the same vein that he did Baby Driver? Totally fine. That would be awesome. Just call it Baby Driver 2 for all I care. Baby Driver 2 Cannonball Run? Yeah. He punches the clock and just puts in his headphones and a really good EDM mashup starts. Oh my god. I just got Farrah Fawcett style hard nipples, Bo. Shit, you can cut glass with those. <laughs> so they've, they've got the ambulance. Bert and uh, Dom are, are about to take off and Bert Reynolds is like, where's the doctor? And Dom DeLuise is like, the doctor got sick. Meanwhile, Jamie Farr takes off. Uh then sammy and dean are bragging about their odds again and then dean martin seems to see burt reynolds for the first time is like oh no jj whatchamacallit is here jj sniffle bottoms or whatever right like sammy's all worried about that and dean's like no it's the blimp you gotta worry about the blimp (laughs) he'll blow your goddamn doors off that's what he says god he's so drunk in this it's so good he'll blow your (laughs) god damn doors off i think that dean martin's dialogue was 100 percent improvised in this film yeah i mean (laughs) 
then Jackie Chan and his co-pilot leave without hitting the time clock. They're not even technically in the race, Bo. <laughs> yeah, so all of their <laughs> adventures mean nothing. And then Foyt and Farrah Fawcett are in a car across the street taking license plate numbers. And Foyt's like, hey, it's like Whiskey Tango, Niner, Seven. And she's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know. Whiskey what? And he's like, oh, just give it to me. I just want to say just real quick. In my notes, we are over two thirds of the way through this movie and the race hasn't even started it's crazy how little happens in this movie nothing happens in this movie it is not the race then the race the end yeah i've never seen a film that has really less of a constructed story arc premise it's just a bunch of shit that happens yeah, for those people who thought Smokey and the Bandit was a little too complicated, here comes the cannonball <laughs> run to ease your mind. Smokey and the Bandit was A to B to A. This is just A to B. I would go so far as to say it's just A. What is it about? It's about the race. What happens? The race. Well, so what's the dramatic conclusion? The end of the race. We then get to see Adrian Barbeau and Tara Buck, and they're now in newly colored skin-tight jumpsuits, in this case, purple and pink uh they're followed by mel tillis and terry bradshaw in this like death mobile that they've now painted gray clearly drinking oh my god they're drunk <laughs> and as they go to punch their card they just both drop empty budweiser cans on the ground and then mel tillis says like he's like how long how long before we stop and terry bradshaw says eight hours and then mel tillis says oh, uh, uh, damn i, I gotta I gotta go to the john. <laughs> yeah. Broom. Yeah, and the Brock uh Simonson says of uh, those guys are more juice than their car. <laughs> Which is 100% true. Actually, I take that back. He says that about Sammy Davis Jr. and Dean Martin, which tells you that how many alcoholics are at work in this race, where <laughs> that could be said about multiple entrants. Mad Dog and Batman show up. They punch their card. And then they just take a shortcut to the interstate through the trees and the brush, and they just drive off in the woods. Can I say that one of my favorite lines ever since I was a kid is him saying, you know what they say, if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly. <laughs> and then he drives through the fucking trees. <laughs> That's going to be so great. It's terrible. Right? It is the most awful, racist, wonderful movie you ever saw. Roger Moore rolls up. He punches his card and off he goes. Then Burt Convy and his paunch-bellied partner, they show up on a motorcycle. And they're dressed as a married couple. And the fat guy's the bride. And then, boom, they're off. Then Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr., they show up. And they are severely intoxicated. They're arguing over who has to drive. Well, like, hey, we're both real fucked up, right? So you're you're <laughs> gonna start. Oh, you're too drunk. I got it. Then I'll get us to. I don't know. <laughs> Where are we going? I'm going to make a left and we're going to go that way. It's Dean Martin who drives because he's just stayed drunk longer in his life. He didn't get drunk. He just is drunk. Right. He's got more practice. <laughs> they get in this red convertible Ferrari and Dean Martin just staggers his way into the driver's seat. I mean, it's really a real right foot. Uh-huh. <laughs> left foot and then off they go he tells sammy davis jr to hold his drink and sammy davis jr grabs it and finishes it (laughs) (laughs) this movie was rated pg for children you know how funny it is when celebrities drink and get behind the wheel (laughs) dad i remember when you finished mommy's drink (laughs) shut up Remember when you got asked to leave that restaurant when you were finishing everything? Shut up! All right. I remember it. I'll always remember it. (laughs) I don't remember anything. Do they serve beer here? Doesn't matter. I brought my own. All right, so Dom DeLuise says he finally got a doctor, and he's in the ambulance. And Bert asked to see him, and we get our first appearance of my favorite character in the movie, Jack Elam as a doctor of proctology. How do you describe Jack Elam? 
to people who have never seen him before. He is a crazy, googly-eyed prospector who in this movie doesn't have a crazy prospector beard. He looks like a wet galosh. I think he looks like a grandpa that you left out in the sun after playing with him and he just melted a little bit. Right, he's like if you took a Wilford Brimley and put him in the microwave for about 20 seconds and melted him down a little bit. Uh Uh-huh. It's yeah. a little He's bit got two eyes that can somehow see in three different directions simultaneously. <laughs> and he's got kind of, kind of a gruff voice like this. And he is such a delight in this movie. His name is Nicholas Van Helsing. For those who don't know shit about anything, Van Helsing is the name of the guy who killed Dracula. And he immediately gives a super long middle finger. <laughs> like, I never appreciated how long jackie lum's fingers were until this viewing it's like an arsenio hall length middle finger and he says like nicholas van holsing doctor of proctology and it just smacks this ginormous middle finger under burt reynolds nose which you assume is covered in butt stuff and it kind of wetly slaps against his face it's wonderful he also says he he, he says that he's a graduate of the university of rangoon and a graduate of assorted classes at the knoxville tennessee college of faith healing yeah it's wonderful and so they shut him they (laughs) they shut him up in the back of the ambulance and in the back that like as they get in he's kind of got the curtains open (laughs) so he's riding you know in the middle sort of and he's like i understand we're undertaking a journey to california well he also tells him he wants two grand for the trip and burt reynolds says i'll give you 200 bucks and then his eyes roll back in his head and he's like clickety clack he's like my schedule allows me to make some adjustments to join you on your journey <laughs> so he just starts singing california here i come and ha- and, <laughs> and hacking california <laughs> It's so good. <laughs> Burt Reynolds tells Dom DeLuise, he says, I don't want you to ever tell me where you found him. We make these movies sound so much better than they are. Oh, it's such a great joke. Dom DeLuise starts to say, it's just so strange that there were so many animals. And Burt Reynolds is like, hey, I said, don't you fucking tell me where you found him. And I meant it. <laughs> That that Eloise is like, if you don't treat me nicer, you know, he will come around. (laughs) And then they pass Foyt and Farrah Fawcett, who have been in a car accident. Fortunately. Fortunately for them, because Bert immediately is like, open the door, grab her, Uh tells Foyt to go around back to the emergency entrance. Right, you need medical attention, that's where it is. And as soon as they get Farrah Fawcett in the cab good. Abduct her. (laughs) Right, they take off. And she She's like, hey, you just left Mr. Uh, and then they're like, Foyt. Because that's a running gag. Is She she can never remember his name. She says they have to go back and get him. Burr's like, mm, no, uh, we got you now. <laughs> she goes back to the, the back of the ambulance where she sees Jack Elam waiting there. And his response is, my God, the perfect specimen. He asks Burt Reynolds, should I start the examination now? Right, he's like, no. And Farrah Fawcett very wisely is like, I'll just stay up front in the cap with you guys. You think if Jack Elam had completed his examination, maybe he would have found that anal cancer that killed Farrah Fawcett? I think he certainly would have looked. <laughs> We cut to Jackie Chan and his car, where we hear this computerized version of the all too familiar bing, bing, ding, ding, dong, dong, ding. Again, that music that is always played in American movies to signify that we're dealing with an Asian, or as my grandfather would have called it, Orientals. All you need to know about this movie is that Jackie Chan is playing a Japanese person, though he never speaks Japanese in the film. They're driving at night, and Jackie Chan's partner says, this is because it's translated on the screen he says this infrared is the cat's ass and i was thinking is the cat's ass a good thing or a bad thing i don't know i would say the cat's ass is probably a bad thing cat poop ain't fun they turn off their headlights their hud says it's in english by the way roads clear so hopefully they read english and then we cut to our sexy female cannonballers and they're getting pulled over by a police officer the cops in this movie all have giant mustaches (laughs) 
Every single well, one. Well, sure. This cop says, hey, you two are going 160 miles per hour. And he asks Adrian Barbeau for her driver's license. And she reaches in and removes it from inside her bra, exposing her cleavage and a little bit of her underwear. And about this time, multiple cannonballers come zooming by behind the cop. And this horny, dumb police officer just kind of licks his lips looking at their breasts and he's like all shuck ladies i can't write you a ticket with all these lunatics on the road get out of here in your big beautiful sexy breasts and off they go with their cleavage in their lamborghini example number two of somebody just getting absolutely hypnotized by boobs yeah there's a lot of that number three is coming soon so bert is trying to convince his hostage aka farrah fawcett in the back of this ambulance that it's not so bad of a kidnapping when you think about it. and what we call the stockholm syndrome flirting method <laughs> and we see some cops flashing their blues uh behind them and bert reynolds is like hey uh I need you to play along. And she's like, no, I'm not going to play along. And then Jack Liam was like, I got this big needle. Yeah, it's it's full of what? Horse tranquilizers and Everclear 151? Some kind of fish paralyzer. <laughs> yeah. And he, he says, I give it to myself all the time. And Bert is like, well, then go ahead. And he kind of goes, no, no. And he's like, no, no, no. Go ahead and show her. And he's like, mm -mm. And he's like, go ahead. And he finally gives it to himself and then just goes, oh, you want some of this? What about you? All four of his fish eyes roll back in their heads. Yeah. And so when everyone turns him down, he just shoots himself up some more. And so they're like, all right, well, he's checked out. So Dom DeLuise and Burt Reynolds go to meet the cops outside the ambulance, which also would get you shot in today's dollars. Absolutely. They say they're headed to UCLA. In California. <laughs> and the cops are like, you're going to California? What? Dom DeLuise says, well, the patient couldn't fly. And the, the cops are like, well, why not? And Dom DeLuise actually has a really good delivery here. And he goes, well, I don't know. I just drive. You really need to ask the doctor. Oh, no. And <laughs> so <laughs> Dom DeLuise is so funny. Yeah. He's really funny in this. And they open the door and immediately Jack Elam is like, what is the meaning of this crude interruption? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he says your jack elam is almost your dr teeth it's close i mean how far off are they really if i had to cast dr teeth it would 100 percent be jack elam yeah. you know wearing some sort of burning man stovepipe hat Sure. If he, if Jack Elam wore a stovepipe hat in this, how crazy would it be compared to the rest of his performance, which is wonderfully <laughs> maniacal. He, he says that she has cysts in her lungs and can't fly. We couldn't even go to Denver. And they've now clearly kidnapped and drugged her. She's got like laughing gas on, uh, strapped over her face. And she's like, oh, hey, they gave me gas and kidnapped me. And the cops are like, what did she say? Jack Elam has a really funny moment here where he goes oh she's because of the says she's given a certain delirious deliriums and the cops just are like okay and there's a whole gag with uh burt reynolds and and dom deloise holding hands that is reminiscent of the young frankenstein i've seen this movie about 25 times and until earlier today, I didn't know what the hell was going on here. Because during this scene, Dom DeLuise starts to put his hand on his hip, which is the signification that he's going to turn into Captain Chaos. Right. And that is what makes Burt Reynolds take his hand and put it on top of Dom DeLuise's hand to prevent this transformation. And it's very quick and it's subtle and it's poorly directed and poorly acted and edited. And I had never noticed it before until I was reading really really paying attention to this movie and then it evolves into dom deloise and burt reynolds holding hands and we get a good old-fashioned we're uncomfortable and we might be gay moment joke right there's a little gay panic then the doctor just passes out <laughs> jack elam just has had enough and he ch he checks out completely and then burt reynolds again says don't you ever tell me where you got him <laughs> Which is a great running gag. It's like one of the few real jokes in the movie. And it turns out it's really funny because Burt Reynolds is a good comedic actor. He doesn't really give a shit in this movie. He's phoning it in for sure. But he's kind of naturally funny and, and it's a funny delivery. Uh, we get a, a, a quick scene with Roger Moore talking to yet another woman about his time in the RAF. There's a running joke that starts here where she has to smoke and she's about to hit a lighter and he's like, oh no, not that one, dear. We wouldn't want you leaving us just yet. And suggests 
scene that the cigarette lighter is actually an ejection scene, right. which will be paid off at the end of the movie. Again, one of three actual jokes in the film. So worth pointing out. Um, Adrian Barbeau and her pal are being let off the hook again because of showing their tits. And then we go back to Burt Reynolds, who is checking on Farrah Fawcett after she's coming to, after having been gassed and kidnapped. Slash abducted. And she's like, if you guys laid a finger on me, because she doesn't remember, she blacked out. Burt Reynolds is like, no, wait, did you? And looks at Jack Elam and he's just like no I just gave her a little prick oh my god Burt Reynolds kind of looks taken aback as you would and then he says oh this and then holds up a syringe as opposed to what his tiny dick yeah that's the joke I just (laughs) raped her with my small cock in the back of this ambulance Uh -uh. (laughs) that's the joke that is what they're getting at this was PG we then see Burt Convy and his pot-bellied partner um, riding around on their motorcycle. And they're perpetually doing this wheelie the whole movie because the fat guy is so fat that the motorcycle can't go on two wheels. It just doesn't go on the back wheel. Then we cut back to the ambulance and it's here that Sammy Davis Jr. and Dean Martin pull up alongside in their red Ferrari and they tell Dom DeLuise, who's driving, to pull over that they want to bless the ambulance. And Burt Reynolds says to Dom DeLuise, he says, it's like, all right, hey, uh, one of the uh, the priests is black. Let me get this straight. You want to pull over and get blessed by a black priest in a red Ferrari? And they do. They pull over. And then Dean Martin goes over to the passenger side. And he just rambles on and on about a bunch of nonsense. And then Dean Martin opens up the ambulance back door. And he just gets all horned up when he sees Farrah Fawcett. <laughs> and I quote... <laughs> Oh, I gotta bless her, is what he says. At this point, Sammy Davis Jr. and Dean Martin, they just decide to split and go their own way. But it turns out that Sammy Davis Jr. has left our ambulance crew with a flat tire. And so Burt Reynolds proceeds to slap Dom DeLuise in the face. Right, as punishment. Which, as we learn in the uh, credits, is just a form of their communication. Yeah, he slaps him a lot. Yeah. We haven't seen this much slapping in a movie since, what, Fifty Shades of Grey? Yeah, and that was more enjoyable. This is much more of a punishment without the sexy, kinky part. Says you. Roger Moore is in his Aston Martin and he's now with a brunette woman and some trucker calls up ahead on the CB radio and he says that Smokies are on their tail and so Roger Moore and this woman drink champagne cut away to the ambulance and it shows that we are in St. Louis I know this because we see the arch in St. Louis at this point the ambulance pulls into a 7-Eleven much like I used to do when I was a kid on my bike and Jack Elam convinces Farrah Fawcett to let him go into the bathroom with her while she pees or poo-poos and somehow she agrees to this which is gross and i'm specifically referencing pissing or shitting in a 7-eleven bathroom circa 1981 that is vile yeah that's you're gonna get a couple of babies that way (laughs) don't sit on the toilet seat you're gonna get pregnant dom deloise he comes out of this 7-eleven announcing that he has a six pack of beer i'm guessing for burt reynolds and he also has a dr pepper big gulp Hooray! And then Dom DeLuise just starts singing the Dr. Pepper jingle and kind of dancing around and doing a little soft shoe. And I'm like, is nobody in this movie aware that they're in a road race and time is of the essence? We gotta stop and do some product placement. He like, did you see this bag he's got? It's like we got some ruffles. He's got Budweiser, like some Drano. Like the movie just hits the brakes pun intended to be like hey we gotta pay some bills so uh, how about you go to 7-eleven and you get a delicious big gulp like (laughs) uh he's singing about here uh all right on with the show everybody and we're at the hour mark of this movie for a 90 minute movie we're two-thirds of the way through and we have hit the brakes to do a commercial as the ambulance leaves 7-eleven sammy davis jr and dean martin pull in in their red convertible to get gas as uh the ambulance leaves we see a sign hung up over the road that reads re-elect sean kill a commie oh what is his last name oh scanlon and his slogan for re-election is god guns and guts keep us safe from the hippie nuts (laughs) you know bo the more things change the more things stay the same strangely that's my motto too uh i came to it uniquely 
uh, wasn't from this movie, but it's it's nice to see it reinforced. Burt Reynolds tells this officer that's sitting outside the 7-Eleven that the two priests in the red convertible are flashers, and they're responsible for the victim in the ambulance, and that these two individuals are dressed as priests because that makes it more kinky, and also they're armed with weapons. And I just love how this movie was made in a time where you didn't immediately suspect all priests of just whipping out their cocks and inappropriately showing them to other people specifically young boys right having to explain further than they were dressed like priests there are two men in a convertible red ferrari they're priests say no more <laughs> right apb going out right now they are up to no good <laughs> i was 100 percent impressed that burt reynolds didn't say oh and by the way one of the priests is black you know just to put a cherry on top of that bigoted sunday sure so we cut away from this awkwardly as all cuts happen in this movie to sammy davis jr making another bet with jimmy the greek and jackie chan and his co-pilot pass and then he says say greek what are the odds on the japanese team not finishing at all right and then we get the cut back to burt reynolds saying yeah dressing up like priests makes it kinkier and there's a really good delivery here where burt reynolds says they may be armed and the cop says oh i hope so did you see in the background that there was a big sign that says welcome to ferguson <laughs> <laughs> no did it nah i made that up oh but it could have let's just say it was it was yeah but i i thought it was a really funny delivery of that line but yeah he's just like i'm gonna kill a pervert today that's what he's thinking <laughs> and he's black say no more citizen say no more go about your business white man <laughs> um <laughs> this movie's awful it is so he takes <laughs> off and then S sammy davis jr and d martin get stopped and then there's just something about him being uh, sammy davis jr being called tiny and it's just like yeah you're small and it's again it's one of those things where it's like just riff i'm sure something will happen and then nothing does no they also bang on the roof in a, a semblance of music that you feel like should have been better considering their history together and it just sounds like shit yeah it's not real music and it's like oh yeah you could have done Candyman or something there and it would have been something. But this movie it was always going to choose nothing over something. None of that is as thought out as you would think it should be. Yeah. Speaking of thought out plans, Dom DeLuise and Burt Reynolds over here that there's this big roadblock coming up ahead of them. And Burt Reynolds is like, shit, we got a roadblock. <laughs> we got a roadblock and the uh, transmission is... Uh, slipping. And they see a truck ahead of them and Burt Reynolds is like, ah, I got a plan. And he goes, hey, low boy, which is what he calls the truck ahead of him. And he's like, I need a piggyback. Come back. 10-4. Overruled. Then what happens is they get on the back of this truck and throw a tarp over it. So they're going to sneak through this roadblock that way. And Foyt is up there kind of like the tip of the spear for this roadblock with all of the license plates that he wrote down way back in New York. And we're somewhere in Missouri. And he's checking all the license plates. And Roger Moore comes through with his latest conquest, this woman. And he's identifying her as his bride. And he's like, hello, old chap. She really wants to get to the fucking part of our honeymoon. Why don't you let me through this roadblock? And then he like hits a little button and makes his license plate switch over to a different license plate. So he doesn't get caught by the roadblock. Right. And then with the tarp over the top of the ambulance, Burt Reynolds and Farrah Fawcett are hiding out inside said ambulance. Farrah Fawcett is here with her erect nipples and she and Burt Reynolds are having this romantic moment. And Burt Reynolds says, so uh, uh, Farrah Fawcett, um... What did you think was going to happen when we uh, kidnapped you and uh, dragged you inside this ambulance um, with a, a guy and a giant needle filled with um, um, illegal narcotics from Thailand? And Farrah Fawcett, rightfully so, says a gangbang. Yeah. She, she says she thought a gangbang was going to happen. Hey, Dad, that was a pretty good movie. Um, What's a gangbang? Well, son, it's really easier to show you. You know, you know when a woman and a man love each other and they share a very special hug? Well, a gangbang is where a woman and a man and another man and a, another man and another man and all of his friends and some of his co-workers and they all share a special hug. Does that make sense, son? Too much, dad. Too much. 
it's a horrible thing for her to have believed would have happened but it's also the natural assumption in this, in this situation which tells you how terrible it is but it also goes to prove what a real movie star burt reynolds is because it actually turns into kind of a charming scene i found out what a gangbang was because of this film i asked my dad and i was like hey dad what's a gangbang and then he told me to shut up so i asked a friend of mine's older brother uh who sold a lot of weed to make money and he explained it to me incorrectly and then years later i found out the truth and um i didn't you know i didn't find out anything from cannibal run to be honest with you what was the incorrect assumption about the gangbang what did you think it was he told me it was where you take all of your fingers and fill up all of the holes and i was like i don't even know what that means and then he was like do you want to buy a dime bag and i gave him five dollars and he sold me a bunch of shake was this me it was you (laughs) oh uncovering memories left and right (laughs) um uh, the thing i like about this scene is i like when farrah fawcett asks why are you doing this he says we're not rapist we're racist wait he says we're not racist we're racers racist racers rapist racers abominable adominable adominable what does he say he says we're not (laughs) we're not rapists we're racers <laughs> and but when she asked like why are you doing this and he his response is for the hell of it and and i th- like hold on, that hold is- on he says era my father used to work in the coal mines and uh he was 43 years old and uh he was gonna retire and move to florida and fish off a boat and tell my mom a bunch of lies like uh i'm still working in the coal mine and uh I'm not fishing in Florida. But anyway, uh, he retired and he died two days later. And I said, you know, when I get older, I'm uh, going to do whatever the fuck I want, including lie to women. So fuck everybody, including you. Yeah. I mean, and that's kind of the <laughs> the spirit of this movie or kind of what it should be. Not the, you know, fuck everybody part. But it ought to be that sense of rebellion of like, we, we are the pirates of the interstates. Like we're thumbing our nose at the law because we're doing this silly thing for the sake of doing the silly thing. It would like it's a message that would be a lot more fun and would carry a lot more weight if there were anything other than this scene in the movie <laughs> to communicate that idea because this is it. Do you remember Terry Bradshaw and Mel Tillis being in this movie? I do because they come back right now and they get nabbed at this roadblock not because they're drunk in a car filled with Budweiser empties but because they're just cannonballers and they offer Foyt a beer that's the boldness of this movie is you want a beer maybe they hadn't implemented DUI laws in Missouri yet at this point in history I feel like this is about the time period where I was probably sitting in the passenger seat of my dad's truck holding his beer while he drove there's a roadblock up ahead hold this beer tell them it's yours drink some in case they smell your breath (laughs) during Foyt's roadblock they also nab that muscle man and his partner the guy who was holding up the conversion van earlier and this whole scene is here just because the filmmakers wanted to take this conversion van run it at a high speed and crash it into a police car causing an explosion that it results in a fireball that is much larger than anyone on the film crew thought it was gonna be yeah there were a lot of lost eyebrows that day yeah you're far enough back woof (laughs) <laughs> it's kind of great again it's a, a good practical effect and also the rednecks are like hey the word is out about your roadblock you know the cannonballers will will survive we are so close to the end of this movie Bo. we are and then bert and dom de louise do slide off the truck and they bert reynolds gives the guy a good old-fashioned uh keep on trucking there and then they take off. Jackie and his co-pilot are using infrareds again at night, and they get a radar warning and blow past some cops, and that's the whole joke there, is that they're out of super technological, I suppose. It's unclear. And then we get another hypnotic pair of boobs when Jamie Farr, who has called ahead for some Greek food, and immediately, like when the Sonic-style waitress comes to his window, is immediately like, I ordered two milks. I mean, two couscous. And then, then he's like, have you ever considered joining a harem? And then instead of giving her like cold currency, he just gives her a ring and takes off. Yeah, and a fistful of cash. And he says, if you want to join my harem, get a physical. I don't even understand this. Because he takes off, then backs up, then gives her the cash and tells her to get a physical. Sheik Jamie Farr isn't in this movie enough to really matter. 
you're right because uh, we see him here and then i think one more time at right so let's go back to the ambulance and here farrah fawcett and dom de louise are in the cab of the ambulance and farrah fawcett asks dom de louise how he met captain chaos and dom de louise says that when i was a kid captain chaos showed up and helped me beat up nine kids that were kicking my ass and then farrah fawcett says i wish i had a friend like that and dom de louise says you, well you need to wear a mask and a cape and farrah fawcett says Mine would be pink. Everything I wear is pink. And Dom DeLuise says, what about your homina homina, alluding to her panties? And Farrah Fawcett says, oh, I don't wear any. And Dom DeLuise all but passes out, hearing that this woman doesn't wear underwear. Well, and he calls her beauty again in this scene just to remind us all that she doesn't have an identity beyond her sexuality. No, why would you ask her real name? It is, oh my God. It, it is so disgusting. But you know who else wore pink underwear? Lois Lane in that first Superman movie. Oh, that's true. You know who else wore pink underwear? John Benet Ramsey. Ew. I know. That's my thing for the new year. Nostalgia combined with acute discomfort. You know, true crime is real big right now. As a podcast, we should combine more true crime facts with our movie discussions. So it can be like, hey, by the way, this is uh, Eating Raul. While we're talking about Eating Raul, we can also discuss the various ways that Jerry Dahmer tried to create a sex slave by drilling into people's skulls. How about a podcast called Pink Panties? And it's about mostly women who died where their underwear was pink colored. That's a real niche market, right? How about we drill down further and it's just the story of my neighbor. <laughs> Is she dead yet? My neighbor? Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> so then it's daybreak and Jackie Chan and his partner, they look at their computer and it says that they're entering New Mexico, but then a road sign says they're headed into El Paso, Texas. And they're like, oh! So in that scene, then we come back to Adrian Barbeau and Tara Buckman and their large breasts and they're getting pulled over by a police officer. And this time it turns out that the police officer is not a big bushy mustached uh, man, but instead a blonde haired woman who has her own exposed cleavage and Bo the hunter has become the hunted. Yeah. Yeah. Their boob power was met by th the only thing that could stop it. Boobs. <laughs> It's so dumb. And we cut to Roger Moore from here, who's also being chased by a cop. Uh-huh. And then he tells uh his new lady friend, hey, will you hit that button, darling? And it creates a smoke screen. And then he says, well, we could also give them the slip. Hit this other button, darling. And then it creates an oil slick. And there's kind of a cool stunt where uh, uh, the police car spins out behind him. It is a violent rotation, like 360 on 360 on 360. That when you watch it, you're like, did somebody die in this? It's probably a good time to remind the listeners, Roger Moore is not playing James Bond. He is playing a crazy person who thinks he's not James Bond. He thinks he's Roger Moore and yet has decked out his car with spy gadgets and weapons and shit. It's kind of like homegrown terrorism. That's right, Chad. No. Oh. What, was the, what was the movie with Robert Downey Jr.? Tropic Thunder, where you have a crazy person pretending they're Roger or more pretending they're james bond as opposed to an actor who's from australia pretending that they're black pretending that they're something else yeah it's that level of subtle acting um <laughs> so then you cut over to jackie chan as you can tell by the gong sounding Boong. and he's putting a vhs tape of behind the green door oh my god into the console of his car at night so he can get a quick tug in while his co-pilot's asleep one presumes the 1972 maryland chambers pornographic classic behind the green door i mean no one's arguing the reputability of behind the green door here chad he's just driving down the road watching porno man hey it look it happens every day on america's highways and byways this movie is actually strangely prescient in its depiction of the highway porn viewing you know whenever i drive down the interstate and i see people with minivans or suvs and they're watching movies on screens i'm always excited when i can identify the movie and they're usually entertainment for children you know like you realize oh that's spongebob or sylvia the first or whatever 
whatever the hell people are watching now. But there's part of me, like deep inside, that's always secretly hoping I get to see pornography. You never have? You've seen people watching porno? On the interstate? Yeah. Well, I know where you live. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. On the commute to work, just getting, you know, rubbing one out before the sun comes up. <laughs> During the scene, Jackie Chan is watching porno and I guess jerking off. And so, of course, he drives off the road and almost kills himself and his partner who's slipping in the back. At this point, we cut away and we get to see Sheik Jamie Farr and he gets pulled over by a cop. And the whole reason this scene is here to let us know that our team of uh, cannonballers have made their way to Southern California. If I may, this is the moment where the cop refers to Jamie Farr as a camel jockey. Hello, boy, with only 15 minutes left. Let's get in one more really quality racial epithet. <laughs> we then see Batman and Mad Dog. They show back up in our movie. And I think we last saw them at the starting line of the film. Yeah. They've been gone. A cop pulls up and he's like, pull over, pull over. And Batman, uh, not the real Batman, the Batman in this movie. He's like, he says, I got no brakes. I got no brakes. And he looks over at Mad Dog. and He's like, oh, they got no brakes gag. That always works. But it turns out they really have no brakes. And so this pickup truck they're in just jumps over the, a train. And this scene doesn't matter at all. Let me ask you one follow-up question to your description of this scene. Who were you referring to when you said, not the real Batman? Well, Bruce Wayne. <laughs> all, all right. This isn't a... Hold on, we're going to drive this truck over that awkwardly placed piece of plywood and fly atop this locomotive. I am not a crook. Shut up, your Nixon sucks. Oh, in this scene, the same bad impressionist does uh, Howard Cosell after they end up jumping the train. It sounds a lot like his Richard Nixon. It really does. And it's like, you're better qualified to shoot Patrick Swayze. No offense. <laughs> But that's really where your talent begins and ends is killing famous dancer slash actors. We cut to Jackie Chan and his partner. And after they finish jerking off watching pornography, they find their way onto some Baja road race where they're just romping around with a bunch of doom buggies. They get stuck and they use a rocket launcher to blast their car through the air. I'm guessing that this whole scene is there to accompany the train jump from earlier just because filmmakers wanted to see if they could make a car fly through the air. And if Jackie Chan, I'm sure, insisted on being in the car I, absolutely just because he needed to put that on his uh his, his cv now there's a construction roadblock and all of our remaining drivers are just lined up headlights to to bumper one after the other waiting to get around this construction this is some mario kart level rubber banding bullshit of like oh suddenly the final stretch everybody's tied fuck you i was ahead the whole goddamn race and your fucking red shell out of nowhere, your miraculous red shell. Anyway, too specific. Dean Martin goes over to Burt Reynolds and thanks Burt Reynolds for letting the police officers back in Ferguson, Missouri, letting them know that they were sex maniacs. And Burt Reynolds says that it was payback for that flat tire from, quote, the chocolate monk. Yeah. And then there's a whole like, he can say that. Oh, he can say that. He can say that because... No, 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 no. You can't. If you're a white guy, you can't look at a black guy and call him a chocolate monk. It's also slightly uncomfortable that in that scenario, a white guy calls Sammy Davis Jr. the chocolate monk and said black guy looks to his white guy friend to ask if it's okay for that to have been said to him. That's some real like, hey, <sighs> Sammy's going in the back of the hotel kind of bullshit. <laughs> Dean Martin at this point calls Dom DeLuise the Goodyear blimp to kind of, you know, give a little tit for tat. But calling a black guy chocolate monk is way more offensive than calling a fat guy Goodyear blimp. We cut over to Jackie Chan and his partner and they're cleaning out a bunch of sand from their supercomputer car. And then we cut over to Burt Convy and his pot-bellied friend who's wearing a blonde woman's wig. And they pull up on their motorcycle. And as all the cannonballers are bitching and complaining about their predicament being stuck in this roadblock, a huge motorcycle gang shows up at this dive bar across 
the street. And as the motorcycle gang arrives, they all surround Burt Convy and his pot-bellied friend, and they start giving them shit about there being a man dressed like a woman. And the biker gang is uh, led by Peter Fonda, who famously was an easy rider. That's fun, isn't it, Bo? Oh, yeah. Well, nothing says hilarity like the end of Easy Rider, which is all I can think of when I look at Peter Fonda. I expect at at some point for Dom DeLuise just to shotgun him in the gut. When I look at Peter Fonda, I think you produced Bridget Fonda, who is a secret crush of mine, and she married Danny Elfman, who looks like a tennis ball with red hair. A secret crush of mine. I know. I brought him <laughs> up just for you. Oh, uh, <laughs> and it, by the way, the Bridget Fonda thing, not that big a secret. I know. Um, ha- hasn't been for a long time. <laughs> you, after your fifth purchase of Lake Placid, it was like, <laughs> all right, I get it. You're not, you're not there for Oliver Platt. <laughs> <laughs> maybe betty white mm-hmm. my secret secret crush point of no return lake placid <laughs> no digstown <laughs> i i understand what's happening here so in our in our movie <laughs> we're talking about this in our movie we get a good old-fashioned donny brook that breaks out and all of our bikers just start beating the shit out of the cannonballers and captain chaos shows up to get in on the action um jackie chan jumps in and does his martial arts thing and just beats the shit out of these bikers roger moore steps in to give them what for and he's now accompanied by i'm guessing maybe an asian woman but don't matter because roger moore gets punched in the face and gets his ass kicked immediately he ain't worth a shit dean martin slurs out that he and sammy davis jr should really get in on the fight and help the cannonballers but sammy davis jr just casually walks away because look man there's no way this tiny black jewish man is gonna wander his way into this white biker scene instead he goes and calls jimmy the greek to discuss their outstanding bets and how he should be adding more money to optimize his efforts to capitalize on what the hell's going on around him right running a real scam here and burt reynolds has a moment here that is for me iconic in this film where he like punches out a couple of guys and then just goes woo give me somebody and then just somebody tackles him from behind it's really funny (laughs) it is good and so jackie chan of course is the real star of all this because he actually knows how to do this stuff and that's fun adrian barbeau gets dragged off to be raped right it's good that she doesn't because dom deloise goes in and prevents her rape i think it's the other girl that says like you're so macho like after he rescues them and it's a real weird scene um again it's one of those things where like this should be good wholesome fun by beating up bikers Mm -hmm. but uh it somehow manages to make it creepy (laughs) you mean with all the rape and the racism and the anti-semitism and the kidnapping and the drugging and yeah finally dean martin gets choked at one point and this is really the best part of this whole fight sequence where dean martin uh is being choked and the guy choking him just starts to sag and then drops and dean martin turns around and there's jack elam uh having injected the assailant with his hypodermic right and dean martin's response to all of this is say is that good to drink and (laughs) jack elam is like well i don't know i never tried and then just squirt some in his mouth. <laughs> it's like, oh, here are two addicts. Totally different kinds of addicts. But two addicts really find each some common ground. <laughs> uh-huh. If he had squirted it into Dean Martin's mouth, that would have been... <laughs> the best it, that would have made it a, a, the best joke in any movie ever at this point in our film the road opens up and our remaining seven cannonballers all run off to go to the finish the race except for jackie chan who sticks around to martial arts the hell out of all these stuntmen in the finale of the fight jackie chan jumps up in the air and does this parallel leg kick to smack these two guys in the face and when he does this the crotch of his pants rips in two how embarrassing and so everybody just gets on the road and they're all trailing one another and the ambulance is bringing up the rear and then dom deloise is like i can't do it i can't drive that fast and they're like we need captain chaos and then an inexplicable reason he just transforms into captain chaos and i guess what pushes the gas pedal down more that was yeah my question also is like how do you drive faster other than i just push it more anyway captain chaos shows up and drives faster than every 
other car, including a Lamborghini and a Ferrari, while they're in an ambulance no they're not anyway all of this is set to the william tell overture and they're all racing to the finale of the film um the cars speed up um in fast motion to make it seem more action-packed than it is if you look closely you can actually see the bandits trans am shows up in the finale of this film for some reason roger moore now has a new blonde-headed woman in his car who thinks that roger moore is george hamilton that's a funny bit not really uh, Bert Combe's <laughs> motorcycle proceeds to wipe out and cause a pileup of all of the cars of the finalist. And so every cannonballer just jumps out of their car and we are dealing with a foot race, Bo. It's very exciting. Yeah, someone actually yells, it's a foot race. Right, in case you weren't paying attention or you were blind. In this case, I just stopped paying attention. I, the, it, I needed it for someone to be like, hey, wake up. The movie's almost over. Oh, huh, what? It was a race. There's a race happening, right? As they're running, Burt Reynolds jumps into the air to land on the collective gathering of the cannonballers, and they all crumble to the ground, except for Adrian Barbeau and Captain Chaos. And Captain Chaos is out front. He's sprinting towards the finish line to win the race. He's going to be the victor in this coast-to-coast extravaganza. But then Captain Chaos hears a woman scream, Help me, help me, save my baby! So Captain Chaos tosses aside his time it's card. Clancy Brown from the bride. My baby. He, he jumps into the water to save this woman's baby. And at that exact moment, Adrian Barbo punches her card, winning the race. And we see Captain Chaos show up with a dog in his arms. And that was this woman's baby. But Bo, this doesn't make sense. And the very first time I ever saw this movie, I called bullshit on it. When I was a kid drinking my big gulp in the theater that I smuggled in, this movie isn't about the first one to cross the finish line. It's about the best time. And Adrian Barbeau and her gal pal started the race many minutes ahead of Burt Reynolds, Dom DeLuise at all. So if they just picked up their card and clocked it into the machine, they would have won the cannonball run. That's right. It's just bullshit. You know, you know why they didn't do it, Chad? I don't know. Just for the hell of it. Actual song from an actual movie. Just for the hell of Burt it. Burt Reynolds proceeds to berate Dom DeLuise to the point of Dom DeLuise literally almost crying. Your heart breaks for this man. And at this point, Burt Reynolds reaches up and just strips Dom DeLuise of his Captain Chaos mask and cape. And Burt Reynolds is just screaming at Dom DeLuise and displaying a level of anger and violence that you're just like this is how you treat people when the cameras are turned off i know it it's not just him even farrah foss is like really victor you really fucked everybody here right you know like everyone's on the bandwagon nobody is coming to his aid but then strangely enough dom de Louise says yeah i know i fucked up but i didn't really want to be captain chaos instead i wanted to be and he bends down out of camera frame and pops back up wearing a blue star studded outfit and he says i've always wanted to be captain usa and then burt reynolds just gives it his signature <laughs> yeah and then everyone hugs <laughs> a cab shows up filled with mel tillis's and terry bradshaw's and foyt's and then he, our bad guy comes over and roger moore says hello foyt good chap um, how about a cigar? Use the lighter in my car. And Foyt goes over to the car. He lights up the cigar while about, what, 75 people are standing around looking on, giggling to themselves. And the cigar lights up and Roger Moore's like, well, that's queer. And he goes over and gets in his Aston Martin and Foyt's smoking the cigar. And Roger Moore says, hey, chop, how did you light that cigar? And Foyt says, oh, I used the lighter. And then Roger Moore pushes it. And then he gets blasted out of the top of his car into the water over by this pier. And as he crashes into the water, a slide whistle goes, <whistles> sploosh. It's so stupid. Then kids sing about sunshine. And everybody gets yeah. drunk. Everybody's drinking champagne. Burt Reynolds, because he's an asshole, fills his mouth with champagne and then just spits it out on the ground. He's such a dick. And like it's a big helicopter shot pulling up from this crowd of people. Yeah. The song they sing is You Gotta Have a Dream. And it's like, you've got to have a dream if you want to live and you can do it. And that's it. Yeah. But it's 
sung by the ninth circle of hell's children's choir yeah and then we do outtakes which are the funniest part of the entire film absolutely the the one that i like uh, my personal favorite is the the bleeds one the you know i'm gonna take those bleeds and shove them up your nose these bleeds these bleeds right here and i it's just fun to see like dean martin and burt reynolds neither of whom give a shit about this movie no just fucking with each other yes it's that's funny also a look into the psychology of the dynamic between burt reynolds and dom de where he's like no you're gonna hit me you know like dom, this is an abusive relationship we're seeing play out before our very eyes somebody should have intervened after cannonball run to check in on dom de see how he is again foyt is the hero all he wanted to do was like help save the environment get it wet with farrah fawcett and help people not get killed right and i mean he he's a bit of a hall monitor but if that's his biggest crime you know uh, meanwhile again uh jj mcclure has kidnapped and drugged farrah fawcett and by the end of the movie she's just all patty hurst about the whole situation yeah. it's like hey i'm part team jj and you and your crazy multiple personality partner the question is just which of you is going to kill me first <laughs> odds are the the doctor you picked up at a bus station that's the cannonball run bo i have a question for you because i don't know the answer to it what are we going to review in episode two season 10 hot wheels of pick six movies uh chad you know i'm a completist i know when when you're selecting movies for this season you want to do something that's representative of a series in some cases right so we we wanted to take a look at the fast and furious movies oh my god but there's a lot of them. yes chad there's a bunch of them. i know so we figured we would take the one that everyone says hey if you're only gonna watch one right calvin versus hobbs right no, calvin no was it did Bill Watterson direct an action film? <laughs> no, we are we are of course talking about uh, the Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift. Oh yeah, that one. The story of a hillbilly who goes to Japan to learn how to drift drive. Chat. <laughs> it's it is wonderful. <laughs> I love this movie. Spoilers: Tokyo Drift, hilarious. <laughs> Well, I can't wait to see it because I think I've seen two Fast and Furious movies. This is not one of them, but I'm looking forward to seeing it. So I have basically two weeks to get my shit together so that you and I can talk about it. Yeah, I think you're really going to enjoy it. All right. Well, come back and see us in two weeks as we dabble in the world that is Fast and Furious as we continue the season Hot Wheels. Six movies all inspired by motion pictures that are high speed, rubber burning, gear shifting extravaganzas. Please as always like rate review send us an email pick six movies at gmail.com review our show tell a friend bo any final thoughts as always on the cannonball run <laughs> say no more see us in two weeks folks Vroom. <laughs>